Ladies and gentlemen, the conference will begin in two minutes. 各位与会朋友，午安。会议在两分钟后即将开始。Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the International Conference on Southeast Asia in Transition, Geopolitical Dynamics and Economic Integration Outlooks. This conference is organized by the Taiwan ASEAN Study Center of the Zhonghua Institution of Economic Research and is supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Republic of China, Taiwan. Before we begin, let me remind all participants that we welcome all questions regarding our topic today. Please do not hesitate to ask questions or share comments in the chat box. Our distinguished speakers will answer them during our Q&A session. Also, we have some minor adjustments on our agenda. We expect to end the conference at about 4.45 p.m. Taiwanese time. 在此也特别提醒有需要公务人员食宿的与会朋友，请务必填写本场会议的意见调查表，并在此表单中填写完整的个人资料。谢谢。Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have two important guests to give us their remarks for the opening of this conference. First, let us welcome Zhang Zhang Chuanzhang Yuanzhong. President of the Zhonghua Institution for Economic Research, to give his welcoming remarks. President Chang has recorded his welcome remarks on video for us today. Without further ado, let me present you President Chang. Your Excellency Sir Tian Zhongguang, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the International Conference on Southeast Asia in Transition, Geopolitical Dynamics and Economic Integration Outlooks. Although the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted us from meeting in person, we are grateful to be able to organize this dialogue via digital platforms. I would like to express my sincere thanks to my colleagues from the Taiwan ASEAN Study Center for making today's conference possible. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken a heavy toll on the economy and society since the beginning of 2020. Southeast Asian nations are among the many that have been severely affected by this pandemic disease. Lockdown policies had hindered economic growth of most Southeast Asian nations, relied on large labor forces for their manufacturing industry, which is also the pillar for most Southeast Asian economies. Fortunately, the transmission of the pandemic in Southeast Asian nations has slowed down recently, but the fight against this disease is far from over. In addition, the US-China trade war 
for our ancestors the geopolitics and economy of the region, which might lead to a restructuring of supply chains. This is evident in the phenomena of production orders transformed from China to Southeast Asian nations. Furthermore, as we review the history of Southeast Asia, the geographic location of the region stands out as an important feature as it sits in between the Asia Pacific and South Asian region. Southeast Asia had always been sought after by major powers of economic benefits. With the rise of China and uh, the US refocusing its attention on the Indo-Pacific region, Southeast Asia has once again become a crucial region. As you all know, Southeast Asia is illustrated as one of the focal points in the Taiwan's new South Mount policy. Over decades, decades of time, Taiwan has maintained close business ties, people-to-people -people exchanges, and friendly relationships with Southeast Asian nations, such as Malaysia, Vietnam, and Thailand, to name a few. According to the Bureau of Foreign Trade, Taiwan, the total trade value from January to September of 2021 between Taiwan and Malaysia, Vietnam, and Thailand are 18 billion US dollars, 14.9 billion US dollars, and 9.6 billion US dollars, respectively. Correspondingly, it is important to take note of current issues such as regime changes and rising domestic social conflicts within these nations, as the social and political instabilities tend to discourage foreign investors. Last but not least, Taiwan has just submitted her application for the CPTPP membership following China's application on September 16th. This may create more space and opportunity for cooperation between Taiwan and the three aforementioned Southeast Asian nations in the future. In this regard, I believe views from the three experts we have in our presence today we are enlighten our audiences in Taiwan and across the region. Our conference today features distinguished speakers from Malaysia, Vietnam, and Thailand, who will share their viewpoints on the theme of Southeast Asia in transition, geopolitical dynamics, and economic integration outlooks. I am fully confident that they are sharing and discuss today. We are not only have to share light on current concerns of their own countries, but also inspire ideas to further facilitate business cooperation and accelerate economic recovery in a pandemic era. Once again, let me welcome all of you to the conference. Thank you for your kind attention. I wish you all a wonderful time at our conference today. Thank you. President Zhang Chuanzang, Director Christy Xu, distinguished participants from all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Republic of China, Taiwan, it is a great honor to participate in this important event 
organized by the Taiwan Asian Studies Center of the Zhonghua Institution for Economic Research. In recent years, the Indo-Pacific region has accounted for 50% of the total international trade volume and 60% of the global gross domestic product. The intense strategic competition in the international arena has also brought about dramatic changes for the geopolitical and economic landscape of the region. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the US-China trade war, many multinational corporations and enterprises have been under ever-growing pressure to consider diversifying their supply chains away from China. Southeast Asia is of particular importance to the Indo-Pacific region. It forms not only a major hub for the global supply chains, but also the epic center of the rivalry between the U.S. Indo-Pacific Strategic and the China Belt and Road Initiative. Again, this geopolitical background, Southeast Asia has become more attractive to foreign investors than ever before. Thus, the development of Southeast Asia, the world's fattest growing region, will surely shape the 21st century in many ways. Southeast Asian countries and Taiwan enjoy many similarities and our economics are highly complementary. Taiwan is willing and able to engage in cooperation with ASEAN partners based on our shared interests and values. Taiwan seeks to leverage its competitive industries, including the semiconductor, ICT, and machinery industries, and work together with Asian countries to contribute to the region economy, sustainable development, and prosperity. With this in mind, and in the spirit of Taiwan Helps Asia, and Asia Helps Taiwan, Taiwan launched the new South bond policy in 2016. To date, we have reached many achievements, including the signing of more than 80 agreements and MOUs with partner countries. These have covered a wide range of areas, such as trade, education, agriculture, and science and technology. Over the first half of the year, Taiwan investment in New South Bond policy partners increased by 58.8% year on year. Likewise, the investment of these partners' countries in Taiwan increased by 57.5%. Taiwan's investment in Asian countries constitutes 35.1% of the total overseas investment, exceeding the 25.8% for China. As we move toward the post-pandemic era, the new South bond policy will continue to serve as Taiwan's guide for engaging with the region. Through it, Taiwan will seek to further strengthen links with strategic partners such as the United States, Australia, India, Japan, and of course, Asian countries. We are committed to integrating all resources, continuing exceeding projects, and proactively exploring new areas of cooperation so as to further amplify the policy impact. The new South Bond policy not only has helped develop Taiwan's external trade relations, but also has created new opportunities to promote exchanges between Taiwan and the partner countries so that we all can jointly advance regional prosperity. Taiwan may be small in terms of the territory, but it has a large regional presence and a role to play. Therefore, we we'll look forward to joining the comprehensive and the progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership and the signing bilateral free trade agreement and the digital trade agreement with nations throughout the region. Together, we can launch a new economic outlook for the post-pandemic era. 
Lastly, I would like to convey my sincere appreciation to the Taiwan Asian Study Center for making this seminar possible. It provides a great opportunity for us to hear the insights and suggestions for experts from Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. I wish today's event every success. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Minister Tian. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, participants, ladies and gentlemen, for those who just join in, welcome to the International Conference on Southeast Asia in Transition, Geopolitical Dynamics and Economic Integration Outlooks. As mentioned by President Chang in his opening remarks, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected nations across the world and the fight against this disease is far from over. We can also observe new opportunities for cooperation in the, in the recovery from this pandemic, as well as new challenges looming in certain areas. Today, we shall focus on the region of Southeast Asia. And I believe that what is in store for us today will certainly be inspiring and fruitful, both from the presentations from our speakers today and also the discussion afterwards. Without further ado, Allow me to introduce you, our moderator, for the following yeah. session. Christy Xu, Xu Zun Zi Zi Ren, Director, Director of the Taiwan, of the Taiwan Asian, Asian Center. Study Center. It is also my, is also my pleasure to present you, to present you our, distinguished our distinguished speakers for the day. First, we have Dr. Titinan Pongsu Tirat, Director of the Institute of Security and International Studies, Chula Longkong University, Thailand. Uh, doctor, if I may, please say hi to our participants. Hello, hi, good afternoon from Bangkok Thank to everyone. You, doctor. Next, we have Dr. Chandra Mugan Sangavelu, Vice President of the Jeffrey Chia Institute on Southeast Asia, Sunway University, Malaysia. Also, uh, Dr. Chandra, if I may, can you say hi? Thank you, Dr. Chandra. Last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Yuen Hongsen, Vice President of the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. Uh, Dr. Sun, can you say hi to our participants? Hello, Thank good you. afternoon from Hanoi. Warm greetings to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Sun. So before I pass the time to our moderator, may I ask our valued speakers to take a group photo online along with our moderator? Uh, please turn on your screen and smile, and I will do the countdown, and we shall take two photos together, all right? So, get ready. Three, three, two, one. Hold on as I take the second photo. All right, the second photo in three, two, one. All right. We have both photos now. So thank you very much. Without further ado, may, may I present, I present you, you, Director Xu, to, to give her give remarks and begin, begin our next our session. session. Thank, thank you very much. much. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen from Taiwan and abroad. My name is Christy Su, Director of Taiwan ASEAN Study Center. On behalf of the organizer, I warmly welcome all of you to this international conference on Southeast Asia in transition geopolitical dynamics and economic integration outlooks. It is November 17th, 2021 today. We're moving into the 23rd month since the outbreaks of the coronavirus, starting from Wuhan, China, and then expanding to the rest of the world. The past 22 months have witnessed unprecedented impacts of economic developments, activities, and loss of human lives across the globe. As of today, there are more than 250 million confirmed infections and more than 5 million deaths. Global economy has contracted by 3.6% last year. And while some countries gradually recovered since this year, other countries will need more than five years or even longer time to rebound to pre-pandemic level. Among the huge changes caused by the pandemic, Southeast Asia has received negative and also positive effects. Economically, Southeast Asia has 
benefited from strong market demand since the first quarter of this year. The region has also benefited from the so-called reconfiguration or relocation of global supply chains or manufacturing clusters. While politically, as an epic center of the geopolitical competition between two superpowers, the US and China, Southeast Asia has to carefully rebalance between the two powerhouses. The geopolitical and economic competition is expected to escalate further as China has formally applied for the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership membership on September 16th. In the meantime, the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, will enter into force in January next year. All this will bring strong momentum to further integration between the Northeast Asia and the Southeast Asia. Whether these new dynamics will help boost economic recovery and enhance economic cooperation, and how Southeast Asian countries will respond to these changes and challenges, these are the questions we hope to explore and learn from our speakers in today's conference. As today's moderator, I'm honored to introduce to you speakers for today. The first speaker is Dr. Titinan Pongsu Dilak. Dr. Titinan is director of the Institute of Security and International Studies and professor of international relations at the Faculty of Political Science, Chulalongkorn University, Thailand. Dr. Titinam is not only a prestigious scholar in the fields of geopolitics and comparative politics of ASEAN and Southeast Asia. He also provides consultation to investors on both portfolio and indirect investment in the context of Thai politics and macroeconomy with coverage of ASEAN markets. He also assists Thai listed companies in the IPO as we have a large portion of audience coming from business communities today, I believe you will all find Dr. Titinan's analysis and comments very useful. The second speaker is Dr. Chandra Mugang Tangabelu. He is currently the Vice President and Professor of Jeffrey Cha Institute for Southeast Asia, Sangwei University, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Dr. Tan Gangvelu is also research fellow at ERIA, the Economic Research Institute for East Asia and ASEAN, based in Jakarta, Indonesia. For um, audience from Taiwan, area was formally established at the East Asia Summit back in 2007, supported by all the leaders of the summit. The think tank has contributed significantly in providing research support and consultation to ASEAN. Dr. Tangabelu will present both a Malaysian and the ASEAN perspective on economic development in this region. The third speaker is Dr. Nguyen Hong Sung. He is vice president of the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. Before he joined the academy, Dr. Sum served as full-time diplomat at the ASEAN Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Vietnam. His area of research includes the geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific, particularly maritime security and foreign policy of Vietnam. Vietnam is often regarded as the largest beneficiary of the U.S.-China trade war. It is also the most popular destination of Taiwan's FDI outflows into Southeast Asia in the past few years. I believe Dr. Sun's Vietnamese perspective will be of particular interest to some of our audience today. According to the agenda, each speaker will give a presentation for 25 minutes. Without further ado, I now invite Dr. Titinan from Thailand. Dr. Titinan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Pardon me, Dr. Titinan. Sorry, your mic is... Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, uh, the organizers and uh, Director Christy Su and uh, uh, my fellow panelists and uh, audience members. Um, so I hope that uh, I'm being heard. Uh, my sound is clear enough. Um, I have... Uh, uh, first, I need to apologize for not being able to stay the whole, uh, for the whole of the session, uh, but uh, for the first half of it, uh, I will be here. Uh, due to an urgent meeting afterwards. 
Uh, look, I think we have, uh, uh, I have about 20 minutes or so to, to, to make a presentation. I have a little bit of PowerPoint. But I just want to say that uh, it's a pleasure to work with uh, uh, Taiwanese colleagues. Uh, I was last in Taiwan uh, in uh, December 2019 before the pandemic. And uh, over the last two years, I think we've had uh, a, a, a thirst, a hunger for in-person uh, uh, interaction and exchange and, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, conversations, but we haven't had it. So hopefully next year we, we can do that. Um, from, from Thailand's perspective, and I think we're talking about Southeast Asia, uh, earlier, uh, the minister said that, you know, this is the, the region, Southeast Asia, is becoming the epicenter of the Indo-Pacific, the arena of contests and uh, contestation, uh, rivalry competition between US and China. And the Indo-Pacific now is a main geostrategic frame of reference. Uh, we don't talk as much, uh, to my regret, and to many, many others' regret uh, about the Asia-Pacific, but now it's more like Indo-Pacific. I, I will talk a little bit about that. Um, let me just move to a, a little uh, slide, uh, PowerPoint presentation, and then uh, we can go from there. Um, can you see the PowerPoint? Oh, no. Um, Dr. Tikinan, yeah. uh, I can help you share the slides. Please, please do. Please go right to the presentation outlined. Ne next slide, please. Presentation outlined. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, provide them context and then I'll talk about two things, two ways to look at uh, the region here that we're talking about today. Southeast Asia is a region, but the regional organization of Southeast Asia is called ASEAN as we know it. So we use this uh, you know, interchangeably often, but in fact they are distinctive. And then I'll talk a little bit about invitations for Thailand, Taiwan and, and the region. Uh, next slide please. Uh, here's a map. What you know, what you can notice on this map, you know, is a is a straightforward uh, uh, Google map. But look at the South China Sea. It divides geographically mainland Southeast Asia and maritime Southeast Asia, and uh, it it means basically that it's not a not a natural region in a way. It's divided by the sea. If you look at mainland Southeast Asia, it's more natural, uh, more historical. It, it has a shared history over the centuries. But the whole of Southeast Asia. Is, is a bit more mixed, and I think uh, we have to think of it as a maritime uh, part and a mainland part, geographically. Next slide, please. And here again, the, the 10 members of ASEAN. So that was a, before you see the region, now you see the, the, the states uh, of Southeast Asia as ASEAN, 10 countries. Next slide, please. The context of my discussion today is really about you know, we're seeing a, the structure of global uh, framework uh, from the end of the Second World War kind of breaking down, certainly eroding. A lot of people talk about the rules-based liberal international order. Uh, you think about the UN, the, the World Bank, the, the IMF, and all these uh, international institutions that we've had over the last seven centuries. Uh, they're not as effective anymore. And that uh, international order is kind of eroding, breaking down, you can see Brexit, you can see all the tensions uh, coming out of China, China-US rivalry. So um, the, the global governance framework, such as we know it, uh, is breaking down. Now, what's, what's coming back in its place? What's important now? Borders, maps, sovereignty, geopolitics is back. And now it's been compounded by, by COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 is a multiplier in, in, in many ways. It, it tends to exacerbate ongoing trends, uh, certainly not a a welcome development. Uh, it, it affects us adversely uh, in, in different ways, uh, in, in different dimensions. Um, so we used to think, you know, globalization, European integration, the borderless world, all that narrative uh, is now in decline. 
the, the, the new narrative is deglobalization, decoupling, deintegration, protectionism, trade war, and so on. Um, and at the center of it is the U.S. versus China. And uh, a lot of people talk about the new Cold War, and uh, I, I don't, I see it as the same Cold War. It's the old Cold War. It's the same Cold War. It's taking about a, a two and a half decades, two decades pause. If you look at the last decade, so from the 1990s up roughly to, to 2010, you know, you can see that uh, uh, in the two decades after the Cold War, uh, there was a pause of uh, peace, and you thought maybe uh, European integration, and maybe we found a way not to have wars anymore, and maybe the Cold War has ended. Uh, but in fact, in the last decade, we see tensions, we see um, old issues, geopolitics, geopolitical tensions coming back. So to me, this is not quite um, a new Cold War. It's not a Cold War 2.0, but it's a continuation of the ideological uh, struggle and conflict that we saw in the 20th century between the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, the US, of course, won that fight, but now I think we're in a second fight, a second round of that grand um, meta uh, struggle between ideas of organizing societies and economies uh, between the kind of socialist, communist uh, way of arrangement and then, between, and then on the other side, liberal democracy, market capitalism. We thought at one point that liberal democracy market capitalism won and that history had ended, but in fact, that's not the case. China now continues that struggle uh, by having this authoritarian capitalist model, centralized political control with the market consistent, not market driven in my view, market consistent uh, capitalism, capitalist economy. So China is uh, presenting, posing a new kind of challenge beyond the Soviet Union, which never adapted to, to capitalist economy, market economy, but China has. Yet at the same time, China remains totalitarian uh, in ways that the Soviet Union was. So this is a new second round of this old fight. So it's the same Cold War now picking up again. As a result, Southeast Asia um, and ASEAN over the last decade has been divided uh, because of this tussle between the US and China, uh, the erosion of ASEAN centrality, ASEAN, you know, the idea of ASEAN is to maintain strategic autonomy within the region, not to be interfered and, and, and meddled with by the major powers, and to have a national development to prevent internal uh, conflicts within, within ASEAN state, among ASEAN governments, ASEAN states, and, you know, to make ASEAN the center, the central platform for organizing and promoting uh, peace and stability in Asia. This is the ASEAN centrality, I think now it's been uh, facing some challenges and eroding a little bit. We're going to see, you know, Southeast Asia is a kind of a nexus between prosperity and insecurity. Prosperity, insecurity. But we're going to see, I think, more insecurity and less prosperity in the next decade, perhaps two decades. Next slide, please. Um, Southeast Asia is a region first. As a region, you know, it's written in different ways. It's unnatural. I mentioned diversity, mainland maritime, big region, uh, 670 million people, top four countries in the global 20, top 20 for population size, combined GDP of 3 trillion plus, um, 10 countries, all post-colonial except Thailand, multi-ethnicities, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multilingual. So it's a very, very diverse region, um, influenced by the overseas Chinese, had post-war independence movement. In the past, it had uh, pursued export-led uh, economic development, but now more recently facing some limitations and some ceilings on that model. Next slide, please. Um, continuing to look at Southeast Asia's region, uh, you know, it, this is a region with all regimes. Uh, absolutist regime in Brunei, one-party dominant communist regimes in uh, Laos and, uh, and Vietnam, uh, dominant one-party regime in uh, Cambodia, uh, Singapore, um, semi-military uh, regime, Thailand, full military uh, government in Myanmar recently. So, you know, you can look at the spectrum of, of uh, governing regimes and South Southeast Asia spans the entire spectrum. Uh, this region is marked by income gaps across uh, the region, but also within the, the societies. Um, yet it's a compelling region because it has had 
a promising growth trajectories. It has a critical mass, it has a uh, strong potential for demographics, younger populations in a lot of countries with rising, expanding middle classes, and a lot of people, investors in particular, have looked at Southeast Asia as kind of a hedge vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, not to put all eggs in the China basket, but also to, to hedge and to uh, 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 spread the risk into, uh, and, and returns to, to Southeast Asia. Um, next slide, please. Now, I'm just going quickly here. I want to get to the last couple of slides. Um, very briefly, ASEAN is, is the regional organization of Southeast Asia. I look at it in two ways. Mainland, you have uh, CLN TV, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. And in the maritime, I call them the BIMS, Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and Singapore. Uh, I don't have time to go into ASEAN's evolution and so on, but suffice it to say, and all of you will know that we have a lot of acronyms in the region. Uh, the, the, these are ASEAN-centered acronyms. Uh, ASEAN has done very well in the last uh, five decades, um, you know, going through the Cold War uh, and uh, APEC, AFTA, ASEAN Regional Forum, ASEAN Plus 3, East Asia Summit, ADMM Plus, ASEAN Centrality in Regional Security. Next slide, please. Um, continuing as ASEAN as a regional organization, in, in the 2020s, ASEAN straddles and occupies the space of contests and rivalry between China and the U.S. There's no doubt, and the minister mentioned the word epicenter, is kind of the nexus of this uh, rivalry. And if you look at the map, you know, Indo-Pacific, is, is uh, Southeast Asia is right in the center of it, and ASEAN has to manage and navigate uh, between these uh, uh, jostling, jostling two superpowers. Uh, it has succeeded ASEAN, no, no region-wide war within, but the future, uh, we are afraid of uh, tension and confrontation, potentially conflict uh, between the superpowers, and uh, uh, ASEAN uh, governments, states, and societies don't want to be dragged into that, uh, that conflict. But now, you know, it's very alarming that we, we hear talks of war I mean, this is uh, very alarming uh, in the last uh, couple of years. A lot of tension, of course, uh, uh, cross strait with Taiwan, China, South China Sea was mentioned earlier in the opening uh, speeches. Um, China seems to be more dominant in mainland Southeast Asia, and the U.S. is uh, a major player in the maritime. Uh, from Obama's rebalance uh, to Trump's uh, free and open Indo-Pacific, you have Biden now. I see Biden as a continuation of, of Trump in some ways, and uh, a synthesis combining both Obama and Trump uh, under Biden. Biden is very critical, very uh, anti-China in many ways, like Trump. Uh, at the same time, he doesn't want to abandon the rules-based international system, yet he talks about America first as well. Uh, so Biden is kind of a synthesis. Uh, now they have a consensus in the U.S. Uh, against China. Japan uh, is involved in the mainland maritime, of course, but, uh, especially mainland. And now you see basically Everyone wants to come into the Indo-Pacific. You have in, in the EU, European Union, has an Indo-Pacific cooperation strategy. Uh, South Korea has a new southern. Australia has AUKUS, uh, Australia, UK, US. Taiwan's new southbound, and southbound we're talking about today. India, Russia, you know, everyone's coming to Indo-Pacific. And don't talk, and we don't talk about the Asia Pacific anymore. Um, so I see ASEAN, Southeast Asia is kind of uh, moving along the spectrum continuum of democracy, democratization, and autocracy, authoritarianism. Uh, this is consequential. This is consequential, uh, not to be glossed over. Uh, countries that tend to be more, with exception, uh, countries that tend to be more authoritarian uh, seem closer to China, like Cambodia, Laos, Brunei, Thailand to an extent, with the exception of, of course, um, Vietnam. Uh, but you know, you can see that Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, less so much less so. Um, there's a China model in, that we have been uh, kind of uh, uh, considered, I mean, not, not considered, challenged by, I think, uh, of having centralized political control, uh, authoritarian capitalism, very top-down, and there's a, even a geo-strategy behind it, uh, Belt Road Initiative, BRI, and China has parlayed this uh, geo-strategic capital to uh, uh, undertake uh, mass diplomacy and now vaccine diplomacy. Uh, Overall, ASEAN has been divided uh, because of this uh, U.S.-China rivalry competition, and I think ASEAN now is at its weakest point, perhaps 
in all of its 54 years of existence. Uh, China's rise has been divisive, and I see China uh, as a kind of a, a resurgent country uh, with a sense of uh, inevitability and entitlement. I call that the kind of a manifest resurgence. And you can see this most clearly in the South China Sea, but also the Mekong region, uh, where China has built upstream dams uh, uh, at the, uh, the detriment of the downstream countries. Um, next slide, please. And here's a straightforward map of the Belt and Road. So you can see this is a thousand years uh, reclamation, a thousand years reclamation. Uh, this used to exist uh, from the maritime expeditions of Zhang He and then the, the overland uh, uh, Silk Road. And now it's been all kind of uh, amalgamated and uh, uh, contained within the BRI. Next slide, please. And here's the South China Sea, where China has taken over rocks and reefs and made them into artificial islands, has uh, uh, overlapping uh, uh, claims with the Vietnam, Philippines, and other countries, including Taiwan, uh, the Paracels, and then the Spratleys. Next, next slide, please. Uh, here are upstream dams, and then the, the China is built unilaterally without consultations with down, downstream countries in Laos and Cambodia, and in particular Cambodia and, uh, and Vietnam. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, just a brief uh, glimpse of the COVID numbers. I mean, this is a you know a straight kind of a straightforward uh, COVID uh, odometer odometer table. But what's to notice is how Indonesia ranks 14. This is from uh, uh, earlier this month, uh, like uh, two weeks ago. Uh, Indonesia ranks 14. Uh, Philippines 29, Malaysia 30, and Thailand 34. This is significant because if you look at the same numbers last year, a year ago, uh, it was not like this. It was actually on the contrary. Thailand was number 152, Malaysia uh, way down the table, uh, Philippines and Indonesia middle table, uh, and you know now we see the uh, the opposite, which means it's going to take longer. Uh, for the pandemic recovery to take place uh, in, in, in South, a lot of Southeast Asian countries, in particular these four countries. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, to wrap up, I mean, what are we seeing? I want to focus a little bit on, on, on my kind of uh, uh, arguments and, 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 uh, and, and thoughts uh, moving forward and, and views uh, from here. Yeah, I mean, you now see the prosperity focus asia pacific uh, shifting to a more security uh, driven indo-pacific we all talk about indo-pacific now and that in itself is very telling about what's happening in the region it's about geopolitics geo geoeconomics um, security uh, there's a different kind of paradigm two three decades ago we were looking at prosperity trade investment and that's all still there i mean we're talking about the supply chains and value chains and uh, how they have been disrupted and now maybe some adjustments are taking place, uh, production networks and so on. But uh, certainly, you know, uh, it's not what it used to be. I mean, the, the, the prospects, the dynamics on the ground for prosperity in the region uh, is being eclipsed, I think, uh, overshadowed by security challenges and concerns. Uh, as a result, there's a shifting center of gravity uh, in geopolitics and geoeconomics, <clears throat> um, you know, now you see U.S.-China dominating. I also think that the emerging markets that, you know, that we've known, um, Thailand is uh, a good example, but also Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, and other La Latin America and elsewhere, um, the future of growth and development may be moving away from emerging markets. If you look at middle income traps in Malaysia and Thailand, you look at the lack of economic upgrading, you look at the education system and the new technology, innovation. Um, the innovations are coming from, from advanced mature markets. Uh, so if this is a case, it's a huge challenge for, for us in Southeast Asia. Um, China has a lot of internal stress, especially at this time, and a lot of external pressure at the same time. It's a cause for concern because the intersection between internal stress and external pressure is a vulnerable time for China, and it could lead to overreactions and all kinds of things that we don't we don't anticipate. Um, the post-pandemic dynamics 
and recovery trends. Uh, China, China's borders remain closed and probably will stay closed for some time. And that is uh, consequential because uh, uh, you know other countries are reopening, uh, uh, Europe, US, and, and China will be a little bit behind, even though a year ago, a year and a half ago, it was the first country to be struck with the uh, COVID uh, pandemic and also the first two major country to contain the virus. Uh, but now it's facing another different kind of challenge of uh, reopening and uh, under what conditions. So uh, it doesn't look like they will reopen anytime soon. And that has a lot of consequences. You know, the Winter Olympics coming, the 20th Party Congress. So I don't think they want to take chances with the pandemic. Also, there's question about uh, the Chinese vaccines, how efficacious they are. Uh, and, you know, the new variants perhaps uh, coming uh, on stream. So uh, the, the prolonged uh, closed borders will mean that China will may fall a bit behind and the, the, the pressure inside and outside may actually exacerbate. Um, for ASEAN, I think that development promise that of ASEAN of uh, being a single market for uh, production consumption, the ASEAN economic community, uh, that narrative now has uh, suffered a big blow during the COVID pandemic uh, and divisions within ASEAN uh, going back to 2012 and uh, over the South China Sea, over China. China has divided ASEAN and now the US and China uh, conflict, uh, competition and rivalry will further deepen that division. Myanmar had a military coup last February and that coup and the crisis that followed with the violence uh, and now the civil war in Myanmar also has been divisive for ASEAN. So ASEAN is very much divided on a range of issues now. Thailand, um, where I sit, is actually uh, stuck uh, because of the domestic politics and uh, Thailand has a, a fairly passive and inactive uh, foreign policy posture because it's so conflicted at home, it has not been able to reconcile a kind of a democratic system with the monarchy uh, and, and that's, uh, that's going to consume Thailand for the next three to five years. There's a need for a third way <clears throat> in Southeast Asia. and possibly Taiwan, not to be <coughs> dominated by the US-China rivalry competition, not the Quad and AUKUS, not the BRI, but something uh, alternative. We saw that a little bit in the 1950s, not a line, but I think some countries in the region, they, especially ASEAN, want to have a third way, not dominated by the US or China. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I took a little bit more time than I anticipated and, and wanted. Uh, thank you very much. Um. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Titanan, for your very um, insightful presentation. And um, you mentioned a lot of uh, very important issues and phenomena that are taking place right now, including the erosion of war-based international order and also the ASEAN centrality idea, and also uh, 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 this competition between China and U.S. in different, uh, in different arena. So I wonder, I understand that you have to leave for a faculty meeting shortly. Uh, is it possible that I can, uh, I can give you uh, two questions before you leave us? Please. Thank you very much. Yes. The first question is about the uh, CPTPP, uh, because uh, in Taiwan, we pay a lot of attention to the development of Chinese uh, application for the CPTPP member, uh, a CPTPP member in uh, September. So uh, we understand that Thailand is uh, seriously considering to join the CPTPP last year, but this year it has uh, not come, uh, come to the conclusion whether it will formally apply for the membership. So can you elaborate a bit on uh, Thailand uh, current position on joining the CPTPP and if you decide not to join the CPTPP will you have other um, me mechanism or other policy or strategy to take advantage of this um, this uh, uh, de economic development that are very uh, very beneficiary to uh, Southeast Asia including this your uh, national strategy uh, to take advantage of this uh, a relocation of the global supply chain. So this is the first question. The second question is, can you elaborate uh, uh, more on the uh, Biden, uh, Biden Xi Jinping summit, which just uh, con uh, come to the conclusion yesterday? And ca can you give us more of your uh, comments on that uh, conversation, whether it will lead to 
more competition or it will lead to a mixed uh, uh, relations, including um, continuing of the rivalry as well as a competition in certain uh, certain areas. So these are the questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, okay. Um, thank you very much, Director Christy Su. And um, so briefly, CPTPP, Thailand is not in a position to do its homework to join the CPTPP. Uh, because of the domestic political situation, the, the lack of conversation about joining something like CPTPP. Uh, you know, this, this requires um, uh, consultations and, and bargaining between the uh, government, private sector, you know, a lot of companies, uh, a lot of vested interests, uh, even civil society. Uh, and Thailand has had a very uh, mixed experience with uh, trade liberalization outside the WTO framework. For example, uh, there was a bilateral FTA negotiation with the, with the U.S. Uh, in the early 2000s, and that uh, that kind of blew up because of the domestic politics. Uh, it was seen as a, uh, you know, the Thai government at, at that time under Thaksin Chinawat uh, was seen as very close to the U.S., and therefore the people who protested against the Thaksin the, um, government, they then uh, labeled the U.S. as a Thaksin supporter and all of that. Um, so. On, on trade policy and strategy, I think it's a little bit murky for Thailand. It's a bit uh, passive, reactive, and risk averse, uh, lacking the kind of uh, domestic consensus and the homework that needs to be done to hammer out, you know, the, the gains and losses and the adjustments uh, that are necessary with any major uh, trade uh, trade deal. Um, short of that, I think that the Thai authorities, I mean, they also are. Uh, complacent with having joined the RCEP and also having uh, uh, presided over the, uh, you know, the, the, the finalization of the RCEP uh, in, in 2019 and also the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific, uh, even though uh, RCEP will come into force uh, next year. And RCEP, as uh, you know, as we know, is not a gold standard trade liberalization like uh, CPTPP. Uh, it's much more limited. Um, and you know it's been diluted somewhat because uh, there are a lot of uh, bilateral trade deals within the RCEP already. Uh, this is why I think India decided to withdraw because India already counted uh, most of the uh, RCEP members were already uh, had a deal had a trade deal with India. So RCEP uh, is an amalgamation and uh, a streamlining of the ASEAN plus one, the ASEAN uh, Center FTAs with uh, dialogue partners. So RCEP is limited. The Thailand would think that you know it, it has an RCEP already and it's trying to do a bilateral uh, FTA with uh, the EU, for example, uh, but that hasn't gone very far. So uh, my answer is that, you know, uh, unlikely to see Thailand uh, being very aggressive or proactive uh, on the trade liberalization uh, just because of the domestic, the lack of domestic consensus, the preoccupation of the domestic main actors uh, with Thailand's own political future and conflict. Um, on just on this note, I'm just curious too. I mean, uh, Taiwan has Taiwan has applied, and you know, China has applied, and it doesn't look like China. I mean, I don't see China getting entry accession into the CPTPP with uh, Japan and Australia and the, the structure of uh, uh, unanimity, which means that all members have to have, have to approve. But yes, it still applies. So I'm um, just curious uh, why that is the case and and uh, whether Taiwan thinks that it has a real chance of uh, accession if China will not get in. So I think for China, maybe they're thinking of uh, showing some leadership or uh, exploiting or the U.S. withdrew so Th China wants to join, um, maybe that kind of uh, uh, strategy, but it, it might cancel out uh, the Taiwanese uh, chances of getting entry. The U.K. as a result uh, might, might be the beneficiary of this kind of uh, a numbers game. Um, you asked about Biden and Xi Jinping, President Joe Biden and Xi Jinping had a, you know, this is a ongoing, very fluid uh, uh, relationship. And I saw the, 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 the teleconference as a kind of a, a damage control a little bit. It was not uh, designed to make a lot of uh, headway. Uh, it was just to touch base and to, to make sure that things don't get a lot worse. Um, so I think that the rivalry competition and the tension is very much on, uh, very much uh, there, it, it will continue. And um, going back to my point about uh, the internal pressure within China, 
uh, I don't think the Xi Jinping administration and the government uh, will be able to to budge or concede on a range of issues because they they have a lot of internal the stress and strain at home. I mean, uh, the Winter Olympics, uh, you know, the um, uh, the party congress, Xi Jinping's third term, prospective probable third term. Uh, these are all the major issues in China. And then outside, a lot of pressure. AUKUS with Australia, UK, uh, the EU, Indo-Pacific strategy, um, you know, South Korea, Japan, India. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, the Indo-Pacific now is seeing everyone uh, entering the fray. And uh, not, not a good omen, because uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, doesn't have a, a, a prosperity component. It's really all about security. So, uh, not, not a good omen. Quite alarming to me. Thank you. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Titi Nan, for your very, um, very um, um, exciting answers. Especially when you mentioned about Taiwan's application for the CPTPP. And actually, to respond to your question, we have um, Taiwan has prepared for the uh, admission of the uh, very high quality uh, trade agreement for more than ten years. So we think we are much better prepared than China. And uh, and uh, we are now uh, the government is do whatever it can to uh, to 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 um, remove all the obstacles for our for our entry. So we hope that uh, all the CPTPP existing member will delink will delink these two applications so that we have more space uh, we have more space to uh, get to our way. So thank you very much, and I understand that uh, Dr. Titi Nam is going to leave. So thank you very much again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So uh, we are now uh, would like to uh, invite our second speakers for today. And second speaker is second speaker is uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Sandra Mugam Tangavello. He is from um, the Jeffrey Cha Institute for um, Southeast Asia, Sunway University, in Malaysia. So uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Tangavello. Thank you very much. Apologies for the delay. We have encountered some technical difficulties. Uh, uh, apologies. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, can you hear me, Dr. Uh, Shi? Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, uh, Taiwan uh, uh, ASEAN Study Center and uh, Director uh, Christy and uh, I'm, uh, let me start with this. Uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic uh, than uh, Titinan himself. Uh, let me tell you why. Uh, because uh, firstly, uh, ASEAN itself is the most enduring trading bloc in the world. Uh, it has started in 1967 after the uh, Indonesian confrontancy. Uh, that means there's a one day war between Singapore and Indonesia and then we decided to form the ASEAN. So when you look across the global economy, uh, ASEAN is the most enduring, uh, most sustainable, and most stable uh, trading block uh, in the world. Um, and it's expanding, it, it is expanding uh, in terms of RCEP and FTAAP. Uh, so I will start with that uh, dimension. And then uh, let me uh, uh, do my presentation. Uh, uh, quickly, uh, I'm from uh, uh, Jeffrey's uh, Chia Institute for Southeast Asia. And I'm also a member of uh, Senior Fellow at Jeffrey Sachs Center for Sustainable Development at Sunway University. I'm, I'm only a fellow at uh, IRIA, so I, I can't speak for IRIA. So I'm more into the uh, 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 Jeffrey uh, Chia and uh, Jeffrey Sachs Center for Sustainable Development. 
I am I am asked to talk on two important issues. Uh, one is uh, integration issue, uh, and then uh, the other is pandemic recovery. Uh, I will start with pandemic recovery, uh, and then uh, I will give my views, and then I will spend the next fifteen uh, minutes on uh, East ASEAN integration. Uh, in particular, I will give reference to RCEP, uh, Regional Cooperative Economic Partnership, and uh, also uh, CPTPP. Uh, and my view of CPTPP and um, and the Indo uh, uh, Pacific, uh, whatever we call now, US is calling uh, Indo Pacific uh, Economic uh, uh, Framework. Uh, I, I will give some views on those things. Um, okay, let me start with the pandemic shock. Uh, and uh, uh, before I start the pandemic shock, uh, let me put a few things, just three slides. Uh, to show that uh, uh, how uh, Malaysia is trading, and uh, Malaysia's key trading partner is of course uh, uh, Singapore, uh, followed by U.S., China, and Japan, and uh, Thailand and Taiwan. And uh, of course, Taiwan's uh, trade with uh, Malaysia is stable, and it's important for us because uh, the quality of investment that comes from Taiwan is much more higher, very much more higher, and better than uh, the other countries. And in terms of uh, services, uh, 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 this is where Malaysia can uh, increase its competitiveness. Uh, Malaysia's uh, trade restrictiveness index, uh, it's still uh, uh, a little bit high on uh, certain key services, uh, but uh, Malaysia has pushed itself in terms of aviation hub, uh, in terms of uh, telecommunication banking as hub, uh, but as you can see, uh, still uh, we have a lot of uh, degrees of freedom to uh, become more competitive uh, in the services sector. And uh, this uh, service uh, linkages and services liberalization has direct impact on how we're going to participate and improve ourselves in the global value chain itself. Uh, in terms of uh, our uh, restrictiveness, in terms of investment, uh, uh, Malaysia uh, is still competitive uh, with respect to uh, uh, Philippines and Indonesia, and uh, uh, Malaysia uh, uh, ranks a little bit uh, higher uh, than uh, Philippines and Indonesia in terms of FDI, Foreign uh, Direct Investment uh, Restrictiveness Index, based on the OECD Restrictiveness Index, uh, which uh, again, uh, we have a degree of freedom here to actually uh, improve our competitiveness uh, to a large extent. Uh, uh, let me talk a little bit on uh, uh, how the recovery will be uh, and then put all these things aside and then I can discuss more on the integration issue. Uh, fairly, uh, it, uh, ADB is forecasting that uh, we will recover. Uh, fairly, we will have a V-shaped recovery. So from 2020 to 2021, and uh, most countries are going to uh, bounce back uh, strongly, uh, followed by uh, China, uh, of course, uh, uh, Taipei, Taiwan, and uh, uh, other ASEAN countries will bounce back uh, uh, from uh, uh, their lower growth or negative growth. Uh, interestingly, uh, 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 Thailand has put out the third quarter negative growth, uh, but uh, fairly should bounce back uh, strongly. So fairly, we expect a strong bounce back. And again, to put it in perspective, uh, uh, the, uh, the value chain resilient uh, is pretty strong, uh, fairly uh, based on the supply side. So the pandemic uh, didn't destroy any infrastructure. Pandemic didn't destroy uh, any uh, 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 physical infrastructure itself. So most of the physical infrastructure are intact. Uh, the only uh, challenge we have is to manage the movement of people and movement of goods. Uh, fairly, we are uh, moving into that space now uh, in terms of make the GVC resilient. And uh, 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 we are still encountered a few issues on the demand side uh, in terms of uh, the movement of goods and uh, 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 in terms of logistics side. Um, fairly, I think uh, we will resolve it pretty fast. Uh, because uh, uh, this uh, uh, demand side logistic issue seems to be a short run issue and not a medium term to a long run issue. 
So if that's the case, then uh, our uh, GVC activities in the region is expected to uh, recalibrate itself. So what you will see, it's, uh, uh, we will see, we'll see a recovery uh, next year, uh, and we are already coming to the end of uh, this year. So fairly, we will see the pickup uh, and uh, uh, more borders are to open and so on. So uh, let me uh, talk a little bit on uh, uh, the demand side. Uh, the demand side, uh, consumer behavior is shifting pretty fast uh, in terms of uh, how they're going to consume and how we're going to engage them and how uh, uh, we're going to uh, uh, converge with the demand of the supply side. So technology is accelerating. So technology is changing pretty fast based on that uh, dimension itself. So that will be uh, one important challenge uh, that we need to face from the demand side. Uh, and of course, the uh, logistic part uh, will be uh, very critical for us and uh, managing the log logistic part and uh, particularly in terms of uh, 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 the service linkages uh, to make the service linkages more resilient. And uh, it can be done through technologies and there's already a lot of technologies are getting to logistic part to make it more resilient. Uh, the key challenge we have is still uh, the traditional services like tourism uh, that has collapsed. And uh, we are thinking how to revive the, uh, the tourism sector. And uh, we don't have much uh, dimension, uh, policy dimension on this, uh, but uh, this will be very critical for a lot of developing and less developed country in ASEAN uh, to actually move uh, the tourism sector. Uh, because the tourism hub and tourist, uh, tourism linkages are pretty strong and pretty important for growth uh, in the region. Uh, let me uh, talk a little bit on uh, a few other issues uh, of the pandemic, and that will put perspective on uh, the integration issue, and uh, we can directly discuss some of these issues. Uh, firstly, it's the pandemic has uh, affected uh, the employment skill uh, resilience itself which means that uh, uh, in U.S. we are talking about the, uh, uh, the great uh, uh, resignation, which means a lot of skilled people are resigning because they want a better uh, work conditions and so on. So the correspondence between skill and employment has changed quite a bit uh, due to the pandemic. And uh, the pandemic also has uh, uh, affected uh, 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 unevenly uh, in terms of employment. So more uh, younger people, more educated people are affected and uh, how to retool them to back into the, into the labor market will be important for our recovery, uh, which raises a lot of uh, not economic issues, but a lot of social issues. And as you can see, uh, uh, the, the top uh, uh, diagram in Malaysia, uh, the wages has collapsed. Uh, so uh, how to recover, not just creating jobs, but creating employment uh, will be an important point of discussion for us. So uh, in the recovery process, uh, what we're likely to see a jobless recovery, uh, and that is a big, big concern now. And also, uh, we like to see inflation uh, because of this short-run uh, logistic uh, constraints that they are facing. So we would like you to see what we call a stagflation. Uh, that means structural unemployment with inflation, uh, which makes uh, policy design and policy implementation a big challenge for us uh, in the recovery process. So we will see growth, uh, but we're also going to see a lot of uh, challenges in terms of inflation and unemployment. And uh, so we need to design policies uh, uh, very carefully uh, in the pandemic recovery, because the recovery might not be as uh, uh, permanent, it might become very transitory in nature, and then we can collapse back into a recession. Okay, uh, let me uh, quickly talk on the uh, pandemic policy and recovery uh, uh, to put a certain uh, perspective and uh, why my optimism is coming through. Uh, firstly, uh, the pandemic policy uh, and recovery uh, has first two stages. At uh, the first stage, what we did was uh, uh, we uh, looked at three policies, I think. One is the lockdown and restrictions uh, due to the unobservables. So a lot of things we couldn't observe. Uh, we do not know how uh, uh, the virus is moving. Uh, it's moving with people and it's symptomatic. So what we did is just uh, simply lock down and restricted the border. 
But uh, over the years, uh, over the one year, uh, we have moved into the second policy called the vaccination policy, which is for protection. And that has uh, ramped up quite a bit, uh, within, mostly within developed countries and developing countries. And countries that are more open uh, have adopted the vaccination policy very seriously, uh, I think. So uh, this comes from uh, WTO website that uh, 7.3 billion doses in worldwide has already been given. Whether it's a one or two doses, but fairly uh, uh, we are pushing the vaccination strategy. The third one is appearing pretty fast. It's called the COVID-19 therapies, which is called the COVID pills. So we will have, uh, now we have a broader uh, COVID policy in terms of uh, restrictions, uh, movement of people, and then uh, trying to use the vaccination for protection that allow people to move. And lastly is uh, the therapies themselves. So the, the COVID therapies, if they come through and then we put them together, fairly, uh, we will be moving to a framework of opening the borders themselves. Uh, and uh, uh, that design is very important. Of course, uh, when we have B and C more stronger, then fairly uh, we will move into a movement of border issues uh, much more better. The second strategy is uh, we need quite a bit of work, uh, need policy design and levers. Uh, we still don't have much. There are a lot of policy experiments are taking place now, like case of Singapore. Singapore is doing a lot of policy experiment to open the borders. So experiments means they're going to be trials and errors and fairly uh, uh, using uh, the first stage policy to keep the border open. Uh, that, that is the design. But of course we need uh, economic cooperation uh, for mass vaccination and managing a health infrastructure. So fairly the G20, I was very disappointed and especially they, uh, that they didn't discuss a lot of issues on mass vaccination. Uh, which we require for developing and less developed countries. And uh, also economic cooperation or movement of people uh, that uh, we need more and that becomes important. The third uh, issue is how to move from a pandemic to an endemic uh, issues. Uh, we need uh, health policy to design uh, moving from a pandemic to uh, endemic issue. Endemic issues uh, overlap more of the market. So it facilitates the market better than the pandemic. So if we can get B and C, vaccination and therapies together, fairly I think we can move uh, to an endemic stage and then uh, fairly we can manage the movement of people issue. So uh, still we don't have uh, at the national level or at the regional level, uh, uh, the uh, endemic uh, pandemic to endemic transition uh, policies themselves. So fairly we need public private partnership and uh, this becomes very important for us. Uh, as we uh, move into uh, the, uh, uh, the pandemic recovery itself. And let me state very clearly, uh, uh, for pandemic recovery to take place, we need market access. Uh, without market access, uh, that we're not gonna see any uh, recovery process itself. So I think free trade agreements such as ASAP is gonna play an important role uh, in terms of uh, this pandemic recovery itself. So let me state why I, I believe uh, so. So now I come, I spend the next uh, 10 minutes or so uh, on the uh, uh, pandemic uh, recovery uh, on the uh, RCEP and CPTPP uh, and then discuss uh, the CPTPP issues. Uh, I, uh, the earlier uh, presenter already stated uh, RCEP, uh, but he didn't, I think he didn't justify uh, ASEAN, ASEAN uh, by itself. And what ASEAN has done, uh, uh, that, that's what uh, our academics do. They, we have a diverse view. But I'm a trade economist, so I strongly believe in the integration issue itself. So uh, ASEAN is the largest trading block. Uh, and uh, uh, if TPP has kicked in, uh, then uh, we might be working on a different framework. But now uh, ASEAN is the largest trading block. Uh, fairly, uh, it consists of 30% of the world population. Uh, and 30% uh, of the global trade and uh, nearly 30% of uh, 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 the foreign uh, direct investment itself. It's going to be very big. Uh, and uh, the argument is that um, uh, ASEAN, uh, ASEAN is a, a agglomeration of uh, uh, ASEAN plus one strategies. Uh, it's not completely right. Uh, let me explain very clearly why. Uh, ASEAN. Uh, it's a regional integration framework. Uh, ASEAN plus one 
it's only part of that integration framework. So when we say a regional integration framework, that means a region itself is integrated. CPTPP is a trade integration framework. Uh, that means you bring different countries together from a trade perspective and put them in a block. Whereas RCEP is a regional integration framework. Uh, that means you integrate as a region, which has a strong implication for uh, connectivity, uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, global value chain activities, movement of people and movement of goods. So uh, in, in RCEP, we share the border more. Uh, fiscal border and uh, maritime border. So rightly, the earlier presenter was right uh, to divide uh, mainland and the maritime borders. But RCEP actually integrate this stronger as compared to CPTPP. CPTPP, I will explain. CPTPP takes uh, uh, diverse countries in the global world, put them, and initial center was US. That's how TPP was formed. Whereas RCEP, uh, the initial center is not China, uh, to be very clear. ASEP was initiated by ASEAN. ASEAN centrality was very important. So ASEP uh, has this important concept of market driven and ASEAN centrality because ASEP adopts ASEAN framework uh, in how they're going to integrate, uh, which means that uh, it's not a new framework that was adopted. And uh, uh, ASEAN centrality is very crucial for ASEP. And of course, like CPTPP, RCEP is a living agreement. A living agreement means uh, we not only discuss the past issues, but we also will open up to discuss future issues. Uh, that become very important for us. And uh, of course, uh, it's a unifying composition of uh, various uh, uh, ASEAN plus one, but India decided to move out of uh, RCEP, not because ASEAN plus one strategy. It's not because us. Uh, there's other reasons why India got out of RCEP. Uh, that is a different uh, point of discussion. But uh, 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 RCEP is still uh, 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 generally consists of a large uh, uh, dimension itself. Uh, quickly, uh, 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 if you can uh, 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 see the, uh, the regional integration part uh, in terms of the diagram, uh, 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 the blue lines uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the diagram shows uh, how uh, ASEAN connectivity, ASEAN has a connectivity framework uh, driven by ADB, uh, uh, initiated by Japan uh, and Korea, uh, that connects uh, ASEAN together uh, in an integrated framework called the ASEAN uh, connectivity framework. And of course, uh, we co combine the marine time, like widely pointed by earlier, uh, 39, uh, and the uh, mainland. Uh, that's the regional integration part that comes together. So ASEAN uh, uh, actually connects the whole ASEAN together and then links all the way to China. That's the ASEAN. So uh, uh, if I can uh, uh, take that framework and put it into uh, 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 some framework like this, uh, that um, uh, we will start with ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN uh, uh, started in 1967. Then we have the uh, nine countries. Uh, and then uh, uh, if we put another block called uh, CJK, uh, that is uh, China, Japan, Korea. Uh, and ASEP is the first agreement that comes with CJK. So CJK is a uh, uh, free trade agreement uh, that goes across uh, China, Japan, Korea. So that allows for uh, greater uh, GVC activities, more regional integration issues that we have never seen before. So ASEAN plus one doesn't have the CJK impact. So the CJK impact will be very significant for us. Uh, that means movement of goods, movement of people, and movement of investment will be very significant within the CJK. And uh, we also have Australia and New Zealand coming in uh, together, and that forms the ASAP itself. Uh, so uh, the RCEP consists of uh, uh, these uh, 15 countries, and RCEP consists of uh, key chapters. Uh, the key ones are the rules of origin, that has a cumulative rule and minimalist rule that allows movement of goods across these 15 countries uh, uh, and uh, allows for more uh, global value chain activities. Huh? Uh, and then uh, we also have uh, the uh, TPP, uh, that uh, includes uh, uh, U.S. and then U.S. got out of uh, TP, uh, uh, TPP. 
And interestingly, uh, a U.S. already announced uh, uh, they want a different framework, and U.S. is not going to come back uh, to TPP uh, or CPTPP, uh, which is rightly so, because once a member leaves and comes back, uh, he has to fulfill all the uh, requirements again. So it's unfortunate that U.S. left uh, TPP. So we left with uh, uh, the 11 countries. And uh, we decided to form a CPTPP with that, uh, uh, putting uh, 22 chapters uh, of pro uh, chapters as, uh, um, uh, as frozen, uh, which are relevant for U.S. So U.S. is not going to come back. Uh, these chapters will be still be frozen. But still, uh, CPTPP is still a high-value-added uh, trade agreement. So now uh, we have APEC in the center that includes uh, uh, Taiwan. And of course, Taiwan uh, uh, wants to join FTAAP, the APEC uh, White Free Trade Agreement, and also wants to join CPTPP uh, together with China. So free trade, this is how free trade agreements work. Free trade agreement means that uh, these 15 countries or 11 countries put out uh, a framework for integration, and any member, any country outside can actually put in a request to join and a decision of the country to join is based on various factors, how much they trade, how much uh, the, the, the trade between the member countries and that country, and also other uh, growth potential that exists. And rightly, I believe China joining CPTPP was already discussed a few years back. It's not something we are surprised uh, because uh, the aspiration China joins, want to join uh, CPTPP actually shows that uh, the level of market-based principles they want to adopt. Uh, because free trade agreements are legal documents, eh? uh, it's not a political economy kind of discussion earlier we had. So free trade agreements are legal documents that uh, we can go for dispute settlement. So when China agrees to uh, decide to join and ask for, uh, to join, officially join CPTPP, they are actually saying that they are ready to adhere to the rule base market-based principles that CPTPP has adopted, just like ASEP. ASEP is a legal document that uh, allows country, uh, member countries to actually settle uh, uh, dispute settlements, manage movement of people, movement of goods itself. That's where the businesses come in. Huh? So ASEAN and the ASEP, by adopting the ASEAN framework, is actually supporting business GVC activities. The dichotomy between political economy and business is quite clear in ASEAN. ASEAN has no interference in the political economy. Although the political economy is becoming bigger, like rightly pointed out by the earlier uh, uh, speaker, but the framework of ASEAN pins down the legal framework of trade, which empowers the businesses themselves. So uh, what we need to do is manage the political economy, fair enough, but the legal framework uh, that's already been set uh, will allow businesses to participate uh, in trade and regional agreement itself, regional trade and global trade itself. And that is very critical to emphasize. So we shouldn't overplay the political economy part. So ASEAN is aware of that, and ASEAN wants more legal, uh, rule-based, uh, intellectual property right, uh, dispute settlement issues. And that is a gravitating effect of Taiwan want to join all these free trade agreements. Uh, it's not because of political economy, because end of the day, the businesses and our businesses grow and how we trade becomes very important for us. And that should be our priority. So, uh, uh, which basically means that uh, from a positive point of view, uh, China has put more pressure on uh, US and also uh, the aspiration for China to join CPTPP at a higher level of free trade agreement actually has uh, uh, provided uh, more avenue for ASEAN itself to see that uh, we can have a rule-based trade with China and have more legal dimension in terms of movement of people and movement of goods. Uh, quickly, um, uh, let me talk about CPTPP. I already mentioned this. Uh, it's a very high-end uh, free trade agreement, and uh, 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 U.S. is not going to join back, and then which basically means that uh, 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 China has an option uh, uh, to meet some of these requirements, and uh, it covers from rules of origin, self certification, uh, to movement of people uh, issues itself. And of course, when China puts in, uh, then uh, it's going to take a long time for the accession to take place. 
So it's not an accession, it's going to be uh, done uh, pretty fast. And of course, uh, US want to uh, uh, speed up is uh, uh, the joining of CPTPP uh, and uh, the member, I think the member countries have approved for them to put in the proposal. So uh, UK will be going to the second stage of putting the proposal before uh, they can be, before they can start a the negotiation themselves. And of course, uh, uh, Korea and uh, Thailand has expressed uh, interest to join CPTPP. Uh, quickly, uh, uh, I will talk about uh, uh, one of the questions that was earlier raised, uh, sent to me uh, by the director is uh, the impact of ASAP. Uh, in terms of pandemic, uh, ASAP will have positive impact uh, on, uh, on the growth because of market access and facilitating GVC uh, impact itself. So uh, it's shown that uh, CPTPP will have some positive impact, but uh, ASAP uh, coming in next year uh, will have even a greater impact for us to give us the momentum for recovery itself. So uh, which basically means that uh, we need to rectify uh, the ASAP uh, pretty fast. So uh, uh, I think uh, we need uh, uh, six ASEAN members and three non-ASEAN members to rectify for that to come into effect. Uh, fairly, we are on track for ASAP rectification itself. And uh, 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 quickly, uh, uh, I would uh, uh, try to uh, wrap up my presentation uh, in terms of uh, uh, ASAP. Uh, as I mentioned, China, Japan, Singapore, and Thailand is already rectified. Uh, fairly, we are expecting uh, two other ASEAN members to rectify. And then uh, we believe uh, Australia, Korea, and New Zealand will also rectify ASAP. So uh, once ASAP is rectified uh, uh, with uh, uh, six ASEAN members and three non-ASEAN members, it come into effect uh, 60 days from that. So fairly, we think uh, ASAP should be kicking in next year. And uh, in terms of uh, 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 my uh, last slide, it's uh, both ASAP and CPTPP. Uh, we are hoping that the CJK impact will be stronger uh, because of uh, China, Japan, Korea impact, and that will accelerate our uh, global value chain to the next stage and push us into uh, a different stage of growth. And most ASEAN countries are expecting uh, the CJK impact. So uh, countries like uh, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam uh, with their own uh, domestic uh, alignment strategies uh, we'll see the CJK impact will accelerate. Uh, I think our next speaker will speak on the role of Korea in uh, Vietnam and uh, the role of Japan in uh, Eastern uh, Economic Corridor in uh, Thailand. Uh, we'll accel we expect that to link up with the CJK impact and accelerate ASEAN further uh, with uh, Cambodia, Laos, uh, in, uh, in between especially Cambodia. So the other more mature economies like uh, 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 Philippines, um, uh, Malaysia uh, will be very critical for us because Malaysia uh, is in a transition stage to improve its technology uh, and uh, improve its uh, uh, human capital and uh, uh, institutions uh, to be more forward looking. Uh, these are key dimensions that will uh, allow Malaysia to move into the more service linkages and into the digital economy itself. So uh, Malaysia should be moving into that framework. Uh, Indonesia is the fifth largest economy, so, uh, uh, and largest economy in, in ASEAN itself. So Indonesia will be very critical, and Indonesia is already putting the infrastructure, and Indonesia is also uh, uh, going to move his uh, capital. Joko, President Jokowi already announced that he's going to move his capital to Kalimantan which means that uh, Jakarta will become a commercial city. And then uh, we're going to see uh, new infrastructures to picking up in Indonesia itself. So fairly I'm more optimistic uh, in, uh, in ASEAN and uh, the uh, ASAP itself and the CJK impact. Uh, and uh, that will be important for us. Uh, without uh, that East ASEAN integration issue, uh, I can't see uh, Indo-Pacific or uh, 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 Asia-Pacific uh, economic framework coming into place, which basically means that U.S. already announced it's going to build a new framework called the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Uh, and then I think it's also been uh, re-emphasized by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce visit to Tokyo uh, uh, the last three days. 
but that is going to take a long time to actually kick in. Uh, this is a framework that includes India and more wider framework itself. So uh, from business perspective, from recovery perspective, uh, it's uh, 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 there going to be a, a framework uh, but uh, at this time, uh, it's very difficult to see how the framework will be developed. Uh, and uh, it's going to take, uh, ASAP took uh, eight years uh, to negotiate CPT, CPTPP, also uh, TPP took a longer time. So Indo-Pacific framework, it's, uh, it's nice, uh, it's aspirational, uh, but yet, yet to see the details of what U.S. want to do. So basically what U.S. has done, I think, is U.S. has isolated itself away from uh, Asia and East Asia, and of course, uh, from a geopolitical point of view, uh, uh, by China bidding to join CPTPP, uh, uh, basically uh, trying to keep uh, U.S. away. So that is the geopolitical part. But as I want to finish this by saying that uh, CPTPP and ASAP are legal documents, so that there's a clear dichotomy between political economy and the GVC and trading activities themselves. So by having these legal documents, like a free trade agreement, multilateralism, open regionalism, uh, is very important for us uh, to make sure that the business and the GVC activities, foreign direct investment, technology adoption, inclusive and sustainable growth are maintained within ASEAN and East Asia. So thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Tangavelu, that is very insightful and very comprehensive uh, presentation of all the important issues in this region. I'm especially interested in two points you mentioned. The first is the, um, the uh, you mentioned, it touched upon this employment skill resilience of the GVC. And this is something very, very, very important because uh, we heard that, uh, for example, in uh, South Vietnam, two million workers uh, went home and never come back to their factory. So uh, they are now talking more about the resilience of this labor market. The second point you mentioned is about the U.S. isolation, because right now uh, ASEAN is, is there and China is, uh, is part of RCEP and China is also uh, applying to join the CPTPP. But U.S. is not any part of this mechanism. So um, this U.S. isolation will be very interesting for all of our, our audience. So I'll come back to these two points uh, later in uh, during our panel discussion. Thank you very much again. Uh, now uh, I would like to invite our third speaker uh, to present uh, his uh, Vietnamese perspective. Uh, the third speaker is Dr. Nguyen Hong Sum. He is the Vice President of Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. So uh, Dr. Sum, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Christy, and uh, I'd like to express my gratitude to the Taiwan ASEAN Center for um, allowing me these opportunities to uh, present my views on a very important and uh, impactful subject that uh, we all analyzing um, in the region. But the problem with me is that after I listened to two terrific speakers, um, I sort of like uh, find that uh, there are a lot of uh, good views that have been presented by them. And so I'll try to not duplicate them, but to reinforce some of the views which I think are important. Now, my presentation is, um, well, according to the uh, request by the organizer, is going to focus on the geopolitics and ASEAN integration. Uh, so I'm going to, um, uh, well, uh, present a political security analysis of the um, uh, regional and international context and how that is impacting ASEAN as a very fundamental tool for Vietnam's foreign policy. As, you, as all of you know, for the past 30 years or so since um, um, Vietnam opened up to, to the region and the world, ASEAN has always been uh, a very fundamental and key tool to Vietnam's foreign policy. Uh, it has been, um, well, the tool we use to, for market integration. It has been a security tool to ensure uh, a peaceful regional environment and has been also a very important tool uh, for us to conduct um, international relations with the major powers. Without such a tool, Vietnam's voice and relevance would not be as important. And so that is the place of ASEAN in our foreign policy. Unfortunately, 
the regional international context has um, well dramatically changed and it has changed in the way that has impacted this tool of Vietnam. So I'm going to then speak about how the uh, environmental uh, environment has critically uh, changed um, and affected ASEAN. Uh, I will speak about the challenges, but as well as opportunities that um, we perceive uh, as coming uh, to ASEAN uh, as a block, as a regional institution. Uh, I'm going to also speak about uh, Vietnam's foreign policy choices with regard to ASEAN, uh, given the regional context. And I'll uh, perhaps share some ideas for ASEAN and Taiwan interactions in future. Now, um, the global structure in which ASEAN uh, thrived over the past 30 years uh, has fundamentally changed. And in this, uh, in this regard, I sort of like align my views with the previous, um, well, the first speaker, Dr. Fittinen. Uh, we believe that um, uh, the, uh, the geopolitical competition, uh, which is returning to the region, um, is something that ASEAN as a group of 10 countries is too accustomed to. Um, ASEAN as an original institution of five or six countries uh, was born out of geopolitical competition, but ASEAN was able to grow only after geopolitical competition gave the region a break. And therefore ASEAN as it is today is not used to the kind of geopolitical competition that is taking place. So I'm going to talk more about the geopolitical competition, how it is perceived from ASEAN. Uh, secondly, I think I'm going to focus on multilateralism. Multilateralism has, has been a fundamental well, trend that ASEAN uh, integration uh, based on. But well, and, uh, at this point, I, I also agree with Dr. Thitinan that the multilateralism is under stress globally and also regionally at the moment. And then I'm going to also talk about the rule of law, the erosion of the uh, rule of law or international law as a uh, global, globally accepted norms um, governing interstate relations is also under stress. Uh, and also I think uh, one other key factor that is impacting ASEAN integration is that the economic fundamentals for ASEAN integration over the past 30 years has gone through some well, dynamics. Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, it's under challenge or stress, but uh, the, the sort of like strength or the foundation of ASEAN e economic integration, such as cheap labor, uh, competent uh, world labor market, the focus on service uh, sectors um, and industries such as tourism or um, well, hospitality, and then the uh, export oriented market. These are well, having new dynamics, which are putting stresses on ASEAN. So uh, first of all, let me talk on the geopolitical well, competition, how it is perceived in ASEAN and why it is impacting ASEAN as, as a regional grouping. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a widespread perception uh, within Southeast Asia that um, the balance of power is shifting in the region. China is uh, rapidly growing both in economic powers and in military power. Um, in, in the last 10 years, for example, um, uh, China's GDP has grown more than uh, two times and it will continue to grow uh, in, in such a manner in the next uh, 10 years. Um, well, um, having, having said that, um, I wouldn't say that the uh, shifting uh, power towards China is going, to be, uh, is going to continue to be linear in the next 10 years or so. The U.S. administration is working very hard with its uh, allies and partners in order to balance the shifting of power uh, towards China. And China is not going to be able to enjoy the kind of um, well, growth or the kind of, um, well, um, uh, of power separation from the U.S. and the rest of the world uh, the, the way it has uh, enjoyed over the past 10 or 20 years. Uh, U.S. is working with its ally in uh, new arrangements such as AUKUS or Quad, um, uh, which is uh, bringing the strength of the Western um, alliance uh, into the Indo-Pacific, which is going to um, serve as, as a uh, balancer towards uh, China's growing power. Uh, Russia is in the region as well, is pivoting to the region, but 
um, that is going to increase or add dynamics into the major powers competition, but it's not going to significantly shift uh, the structure of uh, the major powers competitions away from, or it's not going to do much to alter uh, the balance of power between uh, Russia, uh, between China and, uh, and the US. Now, on the point that uh, Dr. Sitinan earlier about uh, the Cold War version 2.0 is going to be a continuation of uh, Cold War 1.0, I have a slightly uh, differing view. I think, uh, yes, there are some similarities of um, the existing sort of major powers competition to the uh, Cold War 1.0 between the US and the Soviet in the previous incarnation. But the nature of the economies of the major powers are now a lot more interconnected uh, compared to the previous uh, Cold War. The alliances are different, uh, although ideology still play a critical factors, but the world today is a lot more multipolar world. Ideology um, is a factor, but is not as a decisive factor as it was in Cold War 1.0. And there is no appetite uh, in the majority of um, the rest of the international communities to actually take side um, on um, towards any of the major powers or to engage in a sort of confrontation uh, the way we saw in the previous uh, Cold War. And therefore, I think that Cold War 2.0, if you use that terminology, is going to be uh, a lot different from uh, Cold War 1.0. 1. 1. Um, so, uh, the overall perception, I'd say, on the geopolitical competition in Southeast Asia is that, yes, um, well, there will be major co power competition, uh, but um, it's going to be rough. Uh, there's not going to be any clear winner in the next 10 years or so. And most countries are not ready, therefore, to choose side, uh, either towards China or to, uh, towards the U.S. And the hedging is continue, uh, continues to be the major policy of Southeast Asian countries towards uh, major powers competition. This includes security hedging as well as economic hedging. Now, uh, secondly, um, multilateralism uh, is a very key foundation for ASEAN integration and um, uh, multilateralism regionally and globally is also under stress. Uh, it has been uh, a, a very important feature of the global rules-based international systems based on the UN Charter for a long time and it has been multilateralism has always has also been the uh, uh, foundations for global uh, governance or regional governance on um, issues of common concerns such as development health environment or human rights and 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 so it's also uh, a vehicle for regional integrations such as AFTA or RCEP or C CPTPP or whatever uh, but um, multilateralism is under stress. Um, at the global level, people talk about the great fracture. Um, well, Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that there is a fear that the global uh, system is going to be fractured into uh, two, each uh, led by uh, a major superpower, with uh, each with its own currency, trade, and financial rules. We think that the risk is real. And this great fracture at the global level is going to translate into a greater fracture into a smaller and uh, into regional multilateral institutions. And we feel uh, this could be uh, the risk to ASEAN integration in the time to come. So um, I think the, the, the fracture, um, as we see, is due to um, a number of factors that there's less trust now on uh, um, multilateral or uh, regional institutions to uh, provide deliverable to contemporary problems such as pandemic. Uh, people are, countries are in self-help mode. Uh, there's very little that they can rely on multilateral institutions. There's very little uh, leadership, uh, well, prominent leadership roles in regional or multilateral institutions. And there's also a crisis of values in many of the international multilateral institutions that uh, eroded trust on them. So uh, multilateralism is under stress. That's my third, second point. Thirdly, uh, the challenge to rules-based, uh, so international rules as um, um, well norms that govern interstate relationship. Uh, this is also a, a fundamental uh, value based on which ASEAN 
is projecting its uh, normative power. But um, while there's now a lot of talks about the kind of rules-based order that uh, needs to be constructed amid geopolitical competition, and while there's a lot of debates on who should set the rules, uh, who has the legitimate uh, legitimacy to set the rules, who has the right to interpret or to enforce the rules and through what process and who should be included in such a process. So there's uh, a lot of uh, debates now on, um, on the, the kind of rules and uh, normatives uh, structure of international relations. So um, I think th those uh, are the uh, key uh, changes or dynamics in the regional uh, and international uh, environment that is affecting ASEAN. Uh, and this is bringing a completely new level of challenge to ASEAN's integration uh, from the point of uh, political security uh, perspective. Um, it has uh, posed an existential threat uh, to ASEAN, I would say, um, and it's uh, threatening ASEAN centrality and it's also threatening ASEAN legitimacy as the leading uh, regional institutions governing um, everything um, in, in the region. Um, ASEAN's uh, chairmanship uh, is uh, under crisis. There is an absence of a clear leader in ASEAN at the moment. Um, most ASEAN countries resort to their own well, solutions to uh, regional or to their own uh, problems. So there are few uh, countries which think of uh, uh, regional solutions to their national problem, uh, be it um, pandemic or be it economic crisis or wherever. So uh, there's greater uh, self-dependency rather than regional dependency uh, to regional to national problem. Um, ASEAN institution has demonstrated that it has certain limits um, to uh, help um, uh, national countries to overcome regional problem, uh, such as Myanmar issues, such as South China Sea issue, it is increasingly difficult to uh, find a common solutions or common position among ASEAN countries. And uh, uh, the uh, long treasured um, uh, principles of ASEAN, such as non-interference uh, or consensus uh, decision-making process is uh, uh, put into uh, question, not to uh, change uh, those fundamental principles at once, but to look at it in the light of the new context. Uh, how should those rules be interpreted and applied uh, by ASEAN to allow it more flexibility and adaptability uh, to the uh, existing context? And then there comes the question of how ASEAN would look like uh, post-2025, after it has completed its uh, economy and its uh, all, all the blueprint, uh, where and how it should position itself in the regional architecture, whether it should continue to be a caretaker of a broader region, uh, such as the, the uh, well, Indo-Pacific, which we clearly see that ASEAN isn't going to be capable to, or should it just con uh, well, contract itself and be focused on its own business and rather to manage its own in-house business rather than uh, focusing too much on providing the service to the broader region. Um, those are very key and uh, fundamental questions of ASEAN. And then there's um, a, a whole range of uh, economic issues, which I need not repeat the uh, excellent previous uh, presentation by Dr. Sandry, but uh, post-pandemic recovery, how to ensure supply chain, how to uh, well, uh, rebuild or to uh, retain uh, the traditional economic strength of ASEAN, such as tourism, air travel, hospitality service, and then how to uh, re-strategize ASEAN economic integration to meet with current mega trends or emerging issues such as climate change, uh, remodel the economy towards a digital economy, green growth, and how to tackle well, infrastructure, networking, and development within the region. Those are issues which uh, nationally countries in ASEAN all think about, but there's a lack of coordination at the regional level, and there's a lack of uh, regional strategies. Having said that, I think 
ASEAN still has plenty of opportunities, uh, and uh, this is not for ASEAN to claim. So uh, there are a lot of uh, countries outside of uh, the region still look at ASEAN with envy. Uh, we are ASEAN uh, and Southeast Asia as a whole is at the heart of a very dynamic region called Indo-Pacific, uh, which is uh, receiving the uh, shift of the tecton uh, well, global tectonic shift towards Asia. Uh, the ASEAN economic fundamentals are still extremely strong, a young population, large middle class, um, decent infrastructure and growing uh, digital connectivities. Those are the key ingredients for uh, a good and a vibrant ASEAN regions, which is an envy of many other regions in the world. Um, as the previous speakers uh, rightly pointed out, ASEAN by 2030 is going to be the third most populous economy in the world and the fourth largest economy uh, well, in the world by, by 2020 with uh, about 6% of um, um, well, ASEAN's uh, population uh, in, in the middle class range and, uh, and so on. So there is a, a very strong prospect uh, and strong economic fundamental for ASEAN success if ASEAN is able to reap uh, and effectively utilize those strengths. Uh, multilateralism, multilateralism and in terms of uh, multilateral institutions, despite the challenges that ASEAN often receives, uh, ASEAN continues to be the caretaker of Indo-Pacific most inclusive multilateral architecture. Um, this is still a big normative player, player in the region. And this is not because uh, the other extra regional countries uh, fully endorse uh, this role of ASEAN, it is because uh, these countries tried and failed to create alternative to ASEAN. There is no other player who can create such an inclusive, white, broad-based regional architecture um, uh, than ASEAN. ASEAN still has a lot of acceptability uh, in the region despite its shortcomings. So um, let me now move to uh, the third part of my presentation on uh, then Vietnam, what Vietnam choices is uh, in this uh, situation. I think uh, uh, Vietnam's overall objectives in the geopolitics um, of, um, the, of the age is to promote good relations with everyone, to ensure that uh, Vietnam continues to enjoy both um, a good relationship with China as well as with the United States. We, uh, Vietnam is uh, for its strategic autonomy and in Vietnam's uh, foreign policy, it's called independence and self-reliance. And we do so by multilateralizing and diversifying our relationship. That's going to be Vietnam's strategy. And uh, we, uh, uh, that's, that's the strategy and tactically, uh, Vietnam is going to try to uh, avoid getting trapped accidentally into major powers quarrel or uh, confrontation. Um, so um, diversification uh, is is the key uh, sort of like pathway for Vietnam. Uh, that's why we've been receiving a lot of ministers for defense of several countries to Vietnam uh, lately. But also we are receiving also um, uh, high ranking officials from both uh, China and, and the United States all at the same time. Uh, Vietnam also plays up its role multilaterally. So uh, we are investing a lot on uh, the UN, for example, uh, by uh, investing our role on the UN Security uh, Council as a, a non-permanent player. Uh, we are also investing a lot on ASEAN and uh, contribute to the ASEAN process because we have firm belief that uh, multilateralism is going to help the weak, uh, is going to help the middle power or minor power. Uh, we continue to work um, a lot on uh, sending the uh, right messages to all the major powers, make sure that uh, we uh, maintain uh, transparency in our foreign policy. Uh, the four no's policy in our defense white paper is uh, one of such effort uh, to ensure that there is no miscalculation or miscommunication, especially on strategic issues to any of the major powers. And we also um, are going to be proactive and preemptive in uh, clearing problem before allowing the problems to uh, actually um, uh, turn into well into a hot spot. For example, on our on on the broader ASEAN foreign policy, um, the overall ASEAN Vietnam's foreign policy is to uh, 
uh, continue to invest on ASEAN and ensure that it is uh, respected by extra regional powers, ensure that uh, extra regional powers such as the EU, Japan, India, US continue to endorse um, ASEAN's central role uh, and uh, to proactively offer um, ASEAN services um, such as promoting cooperation and providing a pathway or a mechanism or framework for these extra regional countries to engage with the region, having sense that all of these countries uh, need and um, would be interested in uh, finding a reliable uh, mechanisms or vehicle to promote their presence and also interactions with the region. So um, we in uh, Vietnam would uh, invest uh, on ASEAN to uh, properly carry out that function. We also use ASEAN to promote the normative uh, regional architecture based on rules. So um, we uh, will use ASEAN in order to create this dynamic equilibrium in the region, engaging all the major powers in a dynamic and balanced way. Uh, we also use ASEAN to promote rules, um, such as the rule of law, uh, such as uh, uh, UN Charter, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, um, and use them to uh, enforce those rules and norms in the region. So ideas for uh, ASEAN and uh, Taiwan uh, interactions, I think on the economic front, post-pandemic recovery is going to be a common interest for both ASEAN and Taiwan and a priority for all of the ASEAN government um, and Taiwan at the moment. So um, on, on that, I think vaccine developments, medicine developments, um, and um, a common strategy towards uh, post-pandemic recovery is going to be a worthwhile topic for ASEAN and Taiwan to engage on. Um, secondly, how to uh, support one another in order to adapt to the new mega trend, shifting towards um, a, a new model, uh, digitalizations, um, a, a regional, common regional green deal um, is something that uh, we all need uh, strategies to uh, uh, align ourselves with uh, the global climate change agenda, such as COP26, uh, COP um, and how to um, well have uh, well, um, our views air properly in the global process. Um, engage on functional corporations such as health, such as um, uh, semiconductors, which is the Taiwan strength, um, or on other uh, issues um, is going to be of great interest to ASEAN. And also on um, strengthening international law, uh, which is something Taiwan uh, will depict itself from um, uh, as, as a rules-based uh, well, entity is going to be also uh, important. So those are my uh, a few suggestions uh, on the path forward for ASEAN and Taiwan's interaction. So uh, with that, I'd like to draw my uh, presentation to a conclusion and I welcome any comments and questions uh, later on. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Song, for your very, um, also very comprehensive uh, presentation and uh, advice to Taiwan in further engaging uh, ASEAN uh, member state. And that is a very important policy of Taiwan's uh, new South Bank policy because under that policy, uh, uh, a policy has been implemented for uh, six years and um, Taiwan has diversify, not only diversify and enhance partnership with different uh, ASEAN member states, we also have more focus uh, focus in uh, a collaboration with um, ASEAN member state in different different aspects. So that is very uh, encouraging uh, suggestions. Thank you very much. Uh, we would like to now move to the second part of today's conference, and uh, which is the panel uh, discussion. We have listened to uh, listen and learned a lot from the great uh, uh, presentation of our three speakers. And now uh, this panel discussion will allow more in-depth discussion and exchanges of issues that are uh, touched upon or reflected by our uh, speakers. So if I may, I would like to uh, raise a question first to um, Dr. Sung. So my question is, uh, uh, my question is about the CPTPP. And Vietnam has ratified uh, CPTPP and implemented CPTPP uh, provisions and obligations since uh, early 2019. So I wonder, has Vietnam reviewed the effects of the CPTPP implementation 
to Vietnamese economy and its international relations. Uh, you just mentioned that Vietnam wants to uh, make friends with everyone in this region. And what were the main positive gains or benefits uh, after you were admitted to the CPTPP? I raised this question because I am curious uh, for one, for one uh, question. Uh, one of the reasons for Vietnam to join the CPTPP is to reduce its economic dependence on China. Mm -hmm. And I wonder after two years, three years, whether you find that uh, uh, objective for uh, to reduce independence on China achieve its goal. So uh, can you uh, uh, respond to these questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Song. Yes, certainly, Christy. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Um, um, CPPPP has been uh, effective on us on Vietnam since 2019. So it's been uh, barely a year and a half since we implemented, and we are yet to fully understand and fully analyze the impact of uh, CPPPP membership to Vietnam. But I would say the impacts, uh, the initial impact is this: the initial impact is uh, that. Vietnam receives a political recognition internationally as a country which is proactively integrating and is ready to accept the uh, progressive rules of uh, international trade. Um, that is important to Vietnam and that has always been the strategy for Vietnam to um, uh, integrate internationally um, after we, op we decided to open up. Um, to the region and in the world. Um, we use uh, international integration and we use a high level of regional and international standards in order to force ourselves to uh, uh, renovate and to adapt to uh, uh, newer standards in order to conduct domestic reform. So in that sense, uh, we uh, very much achieved the uh, objectives of, uh, well, um, Accept, being accepted in the modern and progressive club of the world. Now, economic uh, benefits and challenges are um, well, trickier to analyze, but uh, what is visible immediately is that our trade with uh, certain countries has jumped immediately after we became, uh, or after CPPP took effect with Vietnam. For example, our trade with uh, Canada, our trade with Mexico, uh, increased by a factor of 30% also um, towards these countries. Uh, we also seen a more uh, rising confidence of uh, international investors towards Vietnam because uh, CPTPP is a long-term investment and it's also uh, also um, has much to do uh, with our domestic legislature uh, and um, investment environment as well. So. Um, it's sort of like a, a guarantee to um, the foreign investors of our uh, investment uh, market. Um, and so I would say that is the immediate benefit that we uh, can visibly see uh, from CPTPP membership. Uh, the challenges um, are trickier to define, uh, depending on how uh, you see, uh, look at it. Uh, one of the great, great challenges to um, make the domestic business a community to fully utilize um, the uh, CPTPP uh, arrangements for their own benefit. The business environment some, sometimes are quite slow in uh, recognizing the opportunities uh, are there uh, and they are hesitant to explore new markets. Although the gate is open, but they are still hesitant to go in and to uh, explore whether there is opportunity. So uh, I, I would say that is the greatest challenge to reap the benefit of CPPPPB um, now that everything is already there. Um, other challenge is to um, align domestic legislation systems um, um, to uh, meet the requirements of um, the uh, CPTPP, such as the labor standards uh, and investments and domestic legislature. But that is more complicated and um, it is accepted that that would take time. Uh, whether or not it helped Vietnam to immediately diversify our dependence on China. Uh, well, I think it's a long process. Um, this uh, is not going to uh, well, provide us uh, that kind of solution uh, in, in one or two years, but we fully believe that this kind of long-term engagements and connectivities in terms of uh, 
policies towards uh, a very broad market is going to set a very strong foundation for Vietnam to diversify its market. So that would be my take. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, to to complement to your remarks, actually, um, Taiwanese company have taken advantage of Vietnam's FTA networks uh, for the past years. For example, to uh, we interview a very large investor, a Taiwanese investor in Vietnam uh, yesterday, and uh, last year because the domestic uh, market was very slow, so they did take advantage of the CPTPP as well as the EU uh, Vietnam FTA to export from Vietnam. Uh, their products to Mexico and also to European markets. So this is something that Taiwanese company actually taking advantage of. So uh, uh, so this is very important for Taiwan, and that's the reason for uh, Taiwanese company choosing uh, Vietnam step, uh, instead of other countries to invest in uh, in this region. So um, uh, to continue this question on the CPTPP, I would like to ask about China. Uh, China has already submitted application for uh, CPTPP membership in um, um, 16th of September. And uh, uh, I remember that your, uh, the spokes lady of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Vietnam uh, immediately expressed uh, its goodwill and offered to share uh, with China Vietnam's experiences in uh, negotiating and uh, preparing for joining the CPTPP. Uh, I wonder what are the experiences and uh, experiences or lessons Vietnam would like to share with China, and according to Vietnam's experiences, how do you assess China's application uh, application for CPTPP? What will uh, be the major obstacles for uh, China's bid? Oh, um, I think uh, um, we um, uh, anticipated that uh, China is going to sooner or later uh, submit its bid for CPTPP, even long uh, before China made this formal application. Um, China um, has uh, aired its policy uh, as a strong uh, protector of the multilateral trading system. Uh, in this competition with the US, uh, China prefers to portray itself uh, as a global leadership in uh, protecting the multilateral trading system and therefore uh, submitting or bidding for membership in the CPPPP um, fits China's strategy and it's also a way for China to contrast the U.S. lack of leadership in multilateral trading system. So we would say, I would say that um, China's um, bid for CPTPP is very much uh, or as much at least politically motivated as economically motivated. Um, however, I think um, China has a legitimate interest in the CPTPP as a global uh, economic power. It cannot afford itself to be out of such an arrangement if such an arrangement become a very important arrangement in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so um, it's, it's a legitimate bit. Uh, whether or not um, China will successfully be able to um, uh, become a member. Uh, that would uh, will be, uh, uh, I think that would depend very much on uh, the uh, rest of the members of the CPP as well as China, whether they would be uh, acceptable or open to the uh, CPTPP rules. And these rules are uh, going to be quite tough, I would say, for China to uh, abide by because it's going to be uh, beyond borders. There are a lot of uh, rules that is going to uh, demand or to require China to change uh, how it uh, conduct its um, uh, governance of the of, of its own economy, uh, and uh, it's going to be in China's view might be considered uh, greatly interfering with uh, China domestic uh, world politics. So I don't know how China is going to be uh, able to um, open to the existing um, CPTPP rules as it is now. But that, um, I assume that uh, it's going to be a negotiation process between China and uh, the CPTPP member um, uh, to uh, well, uh, come to a, a common agreement. And I think in that sense, uh, Vietnam, which went through the same process of negotiation with CPTPP countries, we might um, 
will be able to share some of our experience with with uh, China, just like any other countries uh, would uh, probably do as well. Um, thank you very much. Um, I uh, I hesitate to ask you questions on Taiwan's application for the CPTPP, but if you are willing to answer, please, you're welcome. Um, I haven't now uh, seen or studied uh, Taiwan's uh, application as yet, and this is a topic let's talk about. Uh, but if um, uh, Taiwan has been an active player in APEC, and if CPPPP um, is considered to be an evolution of APEC, then probably uh, we recognize Taiwan's interest in um, becoming a member of uh, a a, a group of such an important player and Taiwan has a very active economy in the Indo-Pacific and Asia-Pacific. Uh, we would recognize it's very logical for Taiwan to have uh, such a desire or application. Well, thank you very much. That is very uh, encouraging. I now have uh, a question for Dr. Uh, Kangavalu. Uh, we understand that Malaysia signed the CPTPP back in 2018 and has not yet ratified the uh, trade pact. And uh, when His Excellency, former uh, former Prime Minister Mahathir, took office after the 2018 general election, he announced that uh, the government will further study the CPTPP as, uh, quotes, uh, the, uh, the CPTPP will put a smaller economy like Malaysia at a disadvantage. So my question is, uh, is there any progress of the study? What are uh, hindering the government from seeking to ratify the uh, agreement? And the same question to Thailand. Will China's application for the CPTPP membership have any policy implications or affect Malaysia government's consideration or decision-making of uh, ratifying the CPTPP? Dr. Um, Tangavelu. Uh, thank you, uh, Christy. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, uh, the earlier presentation by uh, uh, Professor uh, Ong is very important lesson for Malaysia. Uh, how we can use a free trade agreement and align for domestic reforms and how to uh, uh, use that uh, both from a political point of view and from a structural point of view and make it a uh, more comprehensive uh, transformation that you want to do becomes important. So uh, Vietnam uh, rectified very early and he understood uh, the key challenges and put in the institutional ar uh, arrangement for uh, uh, how to reform its economy uh, in line with the CPTPP. Let me give you an example of state-owned enterprise. And these are important issues that were raised uh, in CPTPP. Where else uh, uh, Malaysia uh, got hang up with uh, uh, this, some of these issues? And uh, until now, they haven't rectified. So uh, rectification is very important. Uh, that also goes uh, not just for uh, uh, CPTPP, but also for us. Uh, uh, ratification is an uh, important uh, process in making sure that uh, the economy accepts the rule-based uh, trading system and elevate ourselves to the next stage of growth. Uh, so uh, Malaysia need to think very carefully uh, in terms of these key fundamentals. And uh, this, uh, the longer they take to rectify, uh, then even within ASEAN, uh, countries like uh, Vietnam uh, uh, are leapfrogging. And uh, more investment is going to Vietnam than to Malaysia. So there are competitive issues that are coming through uh, Malaysia. So Malaysia must be uh, more proactive. Uh, uh, and the point that was earlier raised is important. Uh, institutions need to be more forward looking. And the statement that was used earlier by uh, Professor Tong in terms of forward looking institutions, managing, adopting UN kind of uh, principles, WTO kind of principles, forward-looking principles are very important. And this is uh, cut across uh, not just Malaysia, but also for Aljan countries. Malaysia has adopted all these first principles uh, very well. Uh, the question is, can we move our political economy further and deeper into some uh, rectification issue, rectify this, and uh, move the, our uh, industries into the digital space, the human capital space, 
and the connectivity space will be very critical for us. Uh, this challenge is still lingering for us uh, to solve as we try to push ourselves to that space. Uh, Malaysia is trying uh, its best to rectify, uh, given the uh, little bit of the political issues we have. But fairly, uh, uh, the Ministry of Trade and Industry is very proactive uh, in trying to get this done uh, uh, maybe next year or the year after. So to get rectify both uh, uh, CPTPP and also uh, try to rectify uh, ASAP, very crucial and very critical for us. Uh, in terms of moving uh, us to the next stage of growth uh, and to go uh, get more deeper integration with the GDC itself. You mentioned about next year. Is it a uh, first half next year or a second half next year for uh, this ratification uh, plans? Political economies are very difficult to predict. Uh, so <laughs> as you can see from uh, the first speaker and the last speaker, uh, so uh, the, the political economy has both visible and invisible dimensions and also has uh, ratification as also uh, uh, the businesses community need to play a more active role uh, in the ratification process so, so very much as uh, the uh, the political system so it's a very difficult process uh, and uh, more forward looking the institutions are, are more easier we can see the returns but uh, definitely the potential gains are there uh, as reflected by vietnam uh, by uh, rectifying, moving into that space uh, is much more faster. As the political economy shifts, uh, rightly pointed by the uh, first speaker and the second speaker, uh, we need to make sure that our trading system also align so that these uh, political issues doesn't hinder trade. Uh, that is very important for us. Doesn't hinder investment. That's where uh, we need to be very careful. As we play the political game, uh, we want to make sure that the investment uh, is facilitated, trade is facilitated, and uh, a political institution doesn't use um, a trade as a means uh, to achieve their political gains. Uh, that is also equally important. So there are overlaps. Uh, that's why free trade agreements, multilateralism, rightly pointed out by Professor Tong that uh, it is uh, challenged, uh, no doubt about that. Uh, that's the reason why ASEP is very important for us, for ASEAN and for uh, East Asia to rectify and put it into a framework uh, and push it uh, to the next level uh, to make sure that the trading system is intact. Uh, without that kind of framework, without ASEAN centrality, uh, uh, ASEAN and East Asia become more fragile, uh, rightly also pointed out. Uh, thank you very much. Can I also uh, invite you to evaluate or assess China's bid to join the CPTPP? Uh, I'm uh, more in line with uh, the earlier speakers uh, uh, in terms of uh, 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 the, the geopolitics is there. But I also believe that uh, progressively, uh, uh, China has shown that it's very progressive in multilateral trading arrangements. Uh, by a uh, simple example of CJK, uh, by forming, and uh, historically, uh, CJK uh, is very difficult to form. Uh, I was involved in the earlier discussion in uh, putting out a framework uh, 10 years back, talking about ASEAN plus six and ASEAN plus three. And we know CJK is going to be very difficult historically, but we achieved that. Uh, so it shows that uh, things are achievable and uh, China is uh, becoming more proactive in multilateral trading system. And uh, China wants to move to the next stage of growth uh, that is innovation driven, uh, intele uh, intellectually uh, knowledge driven uh, framework. Uh, they have to adopt those things. Uh, those things will be very important for uh, the uh, trading system. So uh, increasingly uh, they are looking for a framework like CPTPP uh, to actually pin themselves down in those kind of training arrangement because uh, in a multilateral system, uh, 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 rule base, uh, uh, intellectual property rights, uh, these are important elements uh, that will um, give us the clear uh, direction on moving us to the next phase of growth, uh, smart technology, space technology, uh, automation, artificial intelligence, uh, we can see ASEAN and East Asia and China is going to become more dominant in some of this space. So instead of having more disputes, um, we must adopt a framework and show your aspiration to join something like this. Uh, 
fairly, as I said, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, any country can join CPTPP. They can put up a proposal. The member countries have to assess. And then the member countries have to allow that to come. And that is based on not just uh, putting in a proposal, but uh, trade, uh, how much trade they do. And uh, China does a lot of trade in Latin American countries and also trade with uh, ASEAN. And so uh, geopolitics is going to play, but trade uh, is going to be a major part. And potential trade uh, is going to be a very key factor. Uh, what is the potential for allowing China to come in CPTPP and how other countries are going to be better off? And of course, the rule base, uh, whether we can strengthen the rule base uh, through CPTPP with China entering is another important point of discussion uh, will be done. I think uh, these are important elements because China is still the largest uh, econ global trading economy. So we need China, if we join, uh, the dynamics completely change in CPTPP, uh, which means that uh, we have two big trading blocks uh, and China is in both, uh, which means that the next level integration will be very interesting to see. So given uh, purely coming from uh, the trade uh, regional integration side, so getting China into the rule base, uh, using that to manage the political economy by one dimension. I'm not sure political scientists like uh, Professor Tom would think that is acceptable, but fairly ASEAN uses that kind of framework uh, to manage and to balance uh, the counterbalance and balance the political economy with this because uh, dispute settlements, uh, uh, island settlements have been settled by international courts. Uh, ASEAN uh, is, cannot be in a framework to settle some of these things. So the framework we set up actually allow us to settle some of these things, environmental issues, haze, uh, island disputes, uh, security issues. These are issues that we have a platform to actually discuss. And that is the critical point. That is the envy of many, many blo trading blocks uh, that uh, they don't have such a, a system where we still can bring in training system and uh, some of these political economy issues to be discussed within our framework. And that uh, ASEAN and uh, ASEAN framework allows for that kind of framework to be discussed. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, the next question is about the RCEP. Um, according to a news report earlier, uh, the RCEP will in, enter into force exactly on January 1st next year. So perhaps Dr. Song can confirm that news later. And ASEAN members uh, expect enforcement of the RCEP will help boost uh, economic recovery. And the RCEP is said to have um, to, to be a very significant step in terms of integrating the three North, uh, uh, the three Northeastern Asian economy, China, uh, China, Japan, Korea, especially uh, uh, China, Japan, and uh, Japan, Korea, because these two pairs have no uh, bilateral FTAs uh, uh, between them. But it is often said that the RCEP will have very limited benefits on ASEAN member states. So uh, can you, um, can Dr. Sung and Dr. Uh, Tangavelu uh, 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 assess what would be the key uh, po or possible contribution of RCEP to ASEAN member state. Is it possible that uh, after the implementation of the RCEP, uh, 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 ASEAN members may even become more dependent on Chinese economy? And how uh, this less developed uh, member state, including Laos, uh, Myanmar, and Cambodia, can uh, benefit from this RCEP? So the question is for Dr. Song and Dr. Tangavelu. So can I invite Dr. Song to uh, uh, come to speak first? Okay, um, I'll try my best. Now, uh, the benefits of uh, RCEP to ASEAN countries, I think is more of a strategic nature to create a multilateral framework where ASEAN uh, can have a democratic voice together with other major economies in the region to set the economic policies of the whole region. Now, uh, not that the region uh, didn't have such a mechanism before, but to have a comprehensive arrangement where um, ASEAN uh, is included in such an arrangement and ASEAN can join voices with other economies such as Japan, Korea, to uh, set policy directions uh, on an equal footing with China. That is the uh, political and strategic benefits that ASEAN is 
going to get. Um, ASEAN already has bilateral uh, trading agreement arrangements with China, but uh, increasingly we felt that such an arrangement doesn't provide uh, ASEAN enough leverage to, to talk to China on uh, current issues as well as emerging issues. So um, the, uh, the benefit is, I would say it's a strategic one and it's not uh, uh, a very, uh, well, in economic terms. Now, uh, on the uh, economic benefits or whether or not it's going to enhance um, our sense dependence on China, I think that uh, it all depends. From Vietnam experience, for example, when um, we entered the WTO, the big question was exactly the same, whether we will... Uh, retain our self-reliance or whether we'll be swallowed by such a huge international trading agreements. And the answer is that the opportunities and the risks always go hand in hand. Uh, it, and it all comes back to uh, your adaptability and your uh, competency in uh, reaping the benefits and tackle the challenge. From ASEAN, we would like to think that this is a huge opportunity because then China is opening its market towards ASEAN and China is increasingly an important trading partner of ASEAN and likewise vice versa. So uh, ASEAN would like to think of this as an opportunity to enter the China market and to increasingly export its products and services uh, to China in a more reliable and predictable way. Uh, and we would not have to um, well, be too politically dependent on China uh, to be able to export or to exploit the China market, if you understand what I mean. Um, and the same goes for Laos and Cambodia. They are now in an arrangement that they can equally well, use uh, the China market for their, for their development. And they have a regional institutions to monitor their bilateral uh, economic interactions with China. That is important. Um, uh, and, and so is Vietnam. Uh, now, uh, Vietnam bilateral relationships or trading relations with China will, will be under a regional monitoring scheme. And uh, that is going to provide a lot of transparency and a lot of stability, uh, which is very key uh, to, to our region. So I'll leave you with that. Um, and um, Dr. Uh, yes, Dr. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, the first point was uh, the benefits. Uh, I fairly agree uh, that ASEAN uh, become more fragmented uh, with China, and as, uh, 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 we need ASEAN uh, uh, because ASEAN allows uh, 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 equal voting rights for all the members, uh, irrespective of size. Huh? Uh, but of course, the voting rights are based on uh, uh, the trading principles. Uh, what are the trading pr principles? Market-based principle, market access, uh, technology, intellectual property rights, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's what they free trade, the RCEP framework actually sets up. Uh, the political issues are there, uh, but it have to be on the trading uh, framework. Uh, that is very clear. So uh, yes, ASEAN wants uh, uh, um, equal for voting rights more for the trading framework. As I mentioned, uh, the political issues uh, will be taken up uh, and complemented with this. Having said that, the simulation actually shows no ASEAN countries are going to be worse off. Why? Because uh, uh, the market access given by ASEAN is much more higher than what we have given in ASEAN plus one. So the framework ASEAN was were negotiated using ASEAN plus one as a framework and to go higher than that. So which basically means that from market-based principles, all countries will benefit. The benefit is a very interesting, a very uh, normative uh, discussion. So benefit is not just writing an FDA. Benefit is also structural reform, the domestic structural reform, and how fast you can do domestic structural reform and facilitate trade and investment. The more ASEAN countries can actually uh, do these reforms and commit and move, from a positive list to a negative list and adopt the rule base and uh, move the economy much more closer to the commitments, the more the benefits they're going to get. So if ASEAN uh, adopts and the, all the ASEAN principles and with the deep structural reforms they willing to undertake, all countries, including the CLMV countries, will benefit fully. That, that simulation is very clear. 
So there's two elements here. One is the uh, the free trade agreement. Second is the uh, investment and trade facilitation that they have to undertake. The reforms, the state-owned enterprise, the SMEs, the technology adoption, and ASEP also has the single rules of origin for 15 countries, and that has never been said before. And with a differential treatment, countries can come with differential growth, and they are given differential treatment for growth. So again, uh, there are elements there that ASEAN countries have to benefit, and they are positive benefits. So, uh, and uh, we need to look at the dynamic gains that are going to take place. And lastly, uh, ASEP is not about China, to be very clear. ASEP is about uh, CJK and ASEAN centrality itself. And that must be reminded uh, because um, Korea controls a lot of technologies. Eh? Uh, Japan also controls a lot of technology. So China has a market, yeah, fair enough. But it's, ASEP is not about China. ASEP is about the 15 countries, including Australia and New Zealand coming together and setting up this big regional trading framework, which means that we're not just talking about manufacturing sector, we're talking about service sector, we're also talking about agricultural sector. So somewhere we lost this debate and thinking it's only China, but it's not China. There's a lot of issues that are involved with uh, Korea, with Japan, and Cambodia is already writing its free trade agreement completed with Korea, and then uh, also with China. So you can see the elevation of the whole region to the next level coming from CJK, China, Japan, and Korea. So it's not a Japan-China issue that we need to be very clear. ASEP uh, is not purely a Japan issue that we want to use that to counterbalance. It's not. It's I, the way I see ASEP, ASEP is a bigger framework, trading framework that we set up to move us to the next stage of GVC growth. That's why we have the rules of origin, and opening up the services sector for more growth. So the service linkages, moving us to the next uh, platform of digitalization. So we have uh, identified financial sector, telecommunication sector, and professional services are key sectors. So as I, as I again, it's not about China and the political economy of China. It's actually about the trading system. We need to gravitate to that so that the businesses can adopt this, businesses can understand. So once you move in the political economy, uh, the whole idea of how we set up the architecture for ASEP and using ASEP to move into FTAP uh, might become a less of an issue. So again, uh, uh, we need to counterbalance this argument. Thank you. Now, um, I want to raise a question uh, related to um, the Biden administration or uh, 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 or um, the U.S. isolation, as mentioned by Dr. Tangavelu, in this region. Um, China is now part of the RCEP and already uh, trying to join the CPTPP, but uh, the U.S. is not part of any of these uh, existing or potential mechanisms in the region. So uh, do you think this will change the power structure, uh, power structure in this region? And um, some uh, ASEAN member states have expressed their disappointment towards Biden administration's lack of um, clear Indo-Pacific strategy or clear ASEAN, uh, ASEAN strategy. Uh, what are the exact expectations of ASEAN member states on Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy or ASEAN strategy? So I'll raise this question to, uh, to you, to two speakers. Um, Dr. Sun? Well, indeed, uh, there's been a lot of complaint from ASEAN on the lack of U.S. Um, economic element uh, in its Indo-Pacific strategy. And the view is uh, well received by the U.S. side. However, I think due to the domestic political environment in the U.S., uh, I don't think they are ready to um, uh, go on a full-scale negotiation on an FTA or uh, re or come back to a CPTPP uh, as yet. Uh, I don't think that is politically viable for the Biden administration right now. Uh, however, I think uh, uh, that's not to say they are completely idle uh, and not uh, reacting to um, the sort of like expectation from ASEAN. I think they have. Uh, in its own way, I think the U.S. is trying to reinsert itself uh, in the region through, uh, um, through, through sectors which I think the U.S. has great strength. 
Uh, and there are a number of those strengths, uh, which the U.S. is actually quite active, uh, but without uh, being put into a complete uh, comprehensive picture of U.S. economic engagement with the region. I'll take uh, foreign direct investments, for example, uh, FDI, U.S. FDI into ASEAN is actually, uh, is actually greater than U.S. investment in Japan, Korea, China, and India put together. So the U.S. has huge FDI interest in ASEAN. It's just that they are under the private sector, so they, they don't count into the account of the U.S. government. Secondly, they are quite active, I would say, in um, promoting um, well, uh, digital connections in the region and uh, also energy network connections. So U.S. digital and infrastructural investments in the region uh, is uh, stepping up, uh, and I would say, uh, quite rapidly, um, um, and uh, we uh, would expect that the U.S. is going to uh, well come forward uh, very forcefully on um, on on those areas in in the time to come. Um, technology is also a U.S. strength, and um, the U.S. is also uh, using that economic strength uh, to uh, step up its cooperations with the region. Semiconductor is a case in point. I'm sure. Uh, U.S. is very active on semiconductors investments in Taiwan, and they are in so in Vietnam as well. And they are going to put up its supply chain of semiconductors in the region because of uh, well visible increase in demand in the time to come. And um, I'd say education uh, continues to be a, a great U.S. strength, and uh, the U.S. is actively engaging uh, the region in that sphere too. So I would say the, the problem with the U.S. is that of a narrative problem. Uh, they are seen as being a, um, uh, not a cohesive uh, economic player in the Indo-Pacific, uh, whereas actually they are uh, quite a formidable force economically. Um, uh, whether or, or not uh, um, the uh, power structure in uh, the region is going to change, that is yet to be seen. Um, I, I think that uh, the Biden administration is uh, re-strategizing their engagement with the region. Um, so it's, I would say it's a bit too early uh, to draw a conclusion of even the Biden administration's policy towards the region, and not to mention how that, imp how that is going to impact the region. So I would say um, that uh, we, we should not uh, well, draw premature conclusions of um, how the region is going to look like in five or 10 years time. Uh, that is going to be a very dynamic process and a lot of things is going to happen from now until then. Yes, thank you very much. And that will be the ASEAN way to respond to all these uh, structural changes. Yeah, five or 10 years. Can I, can I invite Dr. Uh, uh, Tangabelu to uh, speak? Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Director. Um, I agree with the uh, uh, Professor Song uh, on the uh, on the uh, Biden administration. Uh, interestingly, uh, the uh, policies that are uh, revealed by Trump are more clearer than the policies revealed by Biden. Uh, that is uh, very interesting. So, for trading point of view, uh, the risk assessment is very clear. Trump came out and said he wanted to start a trade war, and then he said this is how he's going to do it. So, fairly, we all start adjusting ourselves. Uh, whereas Biden uh, has been going to be a year. <laughs> so uh, within a year, uh, if he can't come up with a clear direction, how the uh, foreign policies are and how he's going to engage uh, ASEAN, uh, that raises some uh, key issues uh, that is being diverted by uh, domestic issues uh, and, uh, and uh, are distracted by them uh, rather than uh, investing in the re foreign region and foreign policy, and also in ASEAN itself, which shows that after a year, uh, a Biden administration is not heavily investing uh, in ASEAN and East Asia. Uh, again, uh, these are important issues. Uh, and I think they should come out with the Indo-Pacific framework earlier, uh, rather than after a year, because a midterm election is coming next year. And then uh, fairly, we will be concentrated on the uh, presidential election right after the 2024, uh, which basically means that uh, 2023, and then basically everything will be distracted. So everything will be in a limbo. 
so uh, uh, it will be good that U.S. Uh, puts out some framework that can engage us. So I'm less optimistic about that, uh, how U.S. will engage us. Uh, but uh, the infrastructure bill is very important for them. Uh, that might set some standards and then give more clarity in the second half. And if we can get more clarity, then uh, Biden might come with more clarity uh, in how we want to engage uh, East Asia and ASEAN. And more uh, uh, Biden administration delays uh, coming up a proper framework uh, than the, the geopolitics. I'm, I'm, not, I'm an economist, not a politician. The geopolitics tells me that uh, you strengthened uh, 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 China uh, quite a bit because China is pushing itself into the multilateral framework and showing that you can take a leadership role uh, in the multilateral framework itself. So that uh, uh, actually uh, make us ASEAN think how to counteract this. Uh, so within uh, East Asia, I think countries like Japan uh, and of course Australia uh, and uh, ASEAN within ASEAN, uh, we, are, we are getting weaker properly, uh, highly, rightly pointed out by the first speaker and the last, uh, Professor Tong, uh, that we need a leadership. So ASEAN need to get the leadership into, into place. Uh, to manage this uh, 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 weakness of the U.S. Uh, initially, we thought Biden would come out stronger uh, in the trading system, but uh, he still uh, hasn't come out. His administration has came out strongly to bring, putting out uh, key strategies uh, in terms of how they manage. Uh, it is a question of narrative, I agree. Uh, that has been discussed a lot on uh, even the infrastructure bill. Uh, there's less narrative on what are the benefits of this. So uh, information, uh, but as we move along um, in the pandemic recovery, uh, digitalization is going to accelerate. Uh, technology is going to accelerate. Multinationals are already moving into that digital space, artificial intelligence space, industry 4.0, 4.2 will accelerate. So businesses want to accelerate this as fast as possible, uh, which basically means uh, ASEAN uh, need to think of this very clearly. Data management, uh, data uh, issues, informational uh, law, uh, all these overlaps a lot with our trading system and overlaps a lot of international trading system. And we need U.S. to be in together with this because uh, without uh, U.S. and Europe uh, in this kind of uh, framework, uh, it weakens us quite a bit. Um, thank you very much for this very uh, in-depth uh, analysis of all these very important questions. Uh, we have collected questions from our audience, and here are um, here are uh, uh, one question for Dr. Sung. Um, the audience one audience uh, uh, asks: As Vietnam is growing and plays a key role in Southeast Asia, foreign investment is important in Vietnam. What is Vietnam's strategy to deal with labor shortage? wage increase and electricity shortage. Can you, can you respond um, to this question, Dr. Sun? Okay, uh, labor shortage, we're having um, a problem not with um, uh, general labor, but high-skilled labor. High-skilled labor is in shortage and uh, the government recognized this very clearly. And um, we are putting a lot of efforts in uh, retooling as uh, Dr. Sandra has put it, um, to how to retool the, uh, the well, the middle to high skill uh, uh, labor market in order to be able to more adapt to a new way um, uh, or to the new labor market uh, that is uh, changing very rapidly and adapting to automation, to uh, digitalizations and uh, to new wave of work from home uh, well, after the, the, the pandemic. With regard to uh, shortage, shortage of electricity, as you could see, uh, we have... Uh, Vietnam is actually the fastest Southeast Asian country that is moving on to um, renewable energy. Um, there's been a, a very uh, vibrant government policy to encourage um, investments on to renewable um, energy. And over the past five years or so, the growth in the renewable energy in Vietnam has been remarkable. Um, uh, having said that, we also... Uh, um, as you could see, Vietnam uh, Prime Ministers just came back from COP26 with uh, very strong commitments on um, uh, climate change and uh, on the emission of uh, uh, CO2 level by uh, 2050. 
uh, to achieve a net zero um, well, emission. Uh, that is uh, going to hugely impact our energy uh, market and energy investments. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, the government is very determined uh, to look at the energy sector uh, as a key determinant of uh, long-term uh, growth. Um, so we are working, uh, working on it. What was your third uh, other question? Uh, labor market, um, short of energy, and w what is the third element that you want me to comment on? Sorry, I, I think you cover most of them. Thank I, you. All right, thank you very much. Wage increase, yeah, actually. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, this relates to my next questions for uh, for Dr. Tangavelu. Um, uh, several weeks ago, um, ASEAN has published the first uh, integrated report on climate change in the title of the ASEAN State of Climate Change Report, the ASCCR. Which ends to neutralize, which ends to realize net zero greenhouse um, greenhouse gas emission as early as possible in the latter, in the later half of the twenty first century. And uh, my question is for um, on for Malaysia on September twenty uh, seventh, uh, Malaysia's new Prime Minister, uh, His Excellency Ismail Sabri Yaakob. Uh, announced that the country aims to achieve carbon neutrality as early as 2050, and this is uh, this makes Malaysia one of the most aspirational uh, uh, member states among ASEAN to uh, seek uh, net zero emission uh, emission. So, can uh, Dr. Tangavelu uh, uh, elaborate more on uh, Malaysia's uh, uh, efforts in this regard? Um, um, I, I think uh, ASEAN is very clear uh, in terms of uh, trying to achieve the net zero carbon uh, uh, emission, uh, zero net uh, uh, emission rate. And Malaysia is committed to that, I think, uh, very much committed. And uh, the way we're going to do this is not just uh, 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 putting in regulation, but structurally transforming the key sectors themselves to adopt uh, key uh, uh, technologies, uh, best practices, and also to move, uh, 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 putting technologies uh, that allow us to do achieve this. As you know, uh, 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 Malaysia uh, has uh, agricultural sector as much as uh, services and manufacturing sector. So how are we going to transform? There are plans to transform and make uh, the energy efficient carbon uh, uh, neutral agricultural sector, which is very, very critical for ASEAN itself. So uh, that becomes very important, uh, adopting best practices. And interestingly, uh, service sector is also uh, has that element of green, uh, green energy, green technologies are also important in services as much in the manufacturing. So we will use this uh, framework uh, to structurally adjust and, and introduce new technologies and transform ourselves uh, to the next stage of growth. And uh, this also complements to um, the earlier discussion on the U.S. Uh, if U.S. wants to get back into ASEAN and Asia, they should start looking to these new technologies and start uh, investing in this, helping us invest in these new technologies. Smart cities, green cities are coming out of the COP. Uh, Biden administration will come out with clear statements on how uh, they can help us with the green technology and how we can... Uh, decarbonize ourselves, uh, those things are very, very important. So uh, major institutions like ADB is already committing to uh, decarbonization principles. So Malaysia is committed and you hope our FDI that comes in and our trading system also move into this, that decarbonization framework. Uh, that will be another challenge for us. Uh, that means we need to set up uh, green products, green uh, technologies, standards. Uh, all these things are going to come into play. So uh, we need uh, a framework, and uh, Malaysia has set up uh, that framework and working on that framework uh, to achieve uh, that uh, framework. And that's what the ASEAN uh, report is about, that ASEAN is committed to this and, uh, and to push us in that uh, framework itself. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tangavelu. 
we are now coming to the end of this webinar. And um, I really think, and also I, I believe all of our audience uh, really appreciate all this very insightful and comprehensive analysis by our uh, three speakers. Uh, um, we still have some question, very good question, but unfortunately we do not have time to respond to all of them. So uh, I would like to now call uh, adjourn, to adjourn this webinar and I want to thank uh, um, Dr. Sun, Dr. Tangavelu, and also Dr. Titina, who left early. And uh, thank you very much. And we definitely hope to see you soon, either online or in person uh, next year. So thank you very much. I now adjourn the activity. Thank, thank you, you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Director Shi, for moderating our conference. And many thanks to the speakers for sharing their insights with us. We have come to the end of our conference. On behalf of the Taiwan ASEAN Study Center of the Chonghua Institution for Economic Research, I would like to thank each and every participant for joining us today. Kindly take a few minutes to fill in the post-event survey. Your suggestions and comments will greatly help us in our future events. It will be sent via email to participants who had registered for this conference. If you wish to receive news on our future events, please leave your contact info in the survey. A link to the survey will also be posted in the chat box, as well as the presentation slides from the speakers. You can also download the presentation slides from our website, www.asiancenter.org.tw. Additional information on our center and ASEAN-related issues and topics may be found on the website as well. 最后, 请需要公务人员实数的与会朋友们在意见调查表中 务必填写完整的个人资料, 以利后续行政流程。谢谢各位, Thank you, and we hope to see you again.